From Hong Kong, Chicago, and the city of Stoke-on-Trent, this is the Classic Lenses Podcast. Hello, and welcome to episode 106. My name is Simon Forster, and I'm joined by Johnny Sisson and Perry G. Hello, Johnny. Hello, good morning. And hello, Perry. Hello, hello. And I've I've got to say that that, uh, according to Ricardo Bayon of... uh, Instagram fame and best vintage lens. Uh, this this show is actually now called Classic Classic Lenses on Leica Rangefinders, um, and I think that's right. largely because yeah, he has uh, Ricardo has completely succumbed to uh, listening to you guys just going on and on and on every week about rangefinder lenses. Guilty. Well, tough shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm I'm glad to say. Um, is, is a little bit of balance. There's a reasonable chance we won't actually be talking that much about rangefinder lenses this week um, because we have because a Because you're going to be showing us your St. Louis vibes, right? <laughs> if, I, if, I, if I knew what that meant, then probably. <laughs> um, but uh, we, have a, we have a guest, a returning guest and a special guest for us as well. Um, and I'm particularly pleased that we have Anil Mystery with us and more importantly, he's, it's, he's here in... Much, much, uh, a much more positive light than uh, for, than, than last time. Was uh, for those of you who can remember, uh, Anil was with us in the with our first show back after Carl passed away, um, and he held the hands of uh, Johnny, and myself, and helped us get through and, and helped yeah, us get back on the road again. Wow, has it been that? Has it been that long? It has. Yes. Wow! Wow! Well, uh, so um, yeah, absolutely delighted to have Anil back. So uh, welcome to the show again, Anil. Uh, thank you very much, Simon, and it's lovely to be here. Hi, guys, and hello, hey. listeners. So, uh, right, well, what we're going to do, because Anil has got an absolute shed load of stuff to talk about, um, and as I've already hinted there, there's very little in the way of rangefinder lenses, so uh, let's, uh, let's, let's head over to the world of Anil, um, because I think where we're going to go to first is uh, you did the... Uh, you were part of the sister event uh, to the Southern 16 uh, podcast walkabout that I did in Oxford uh, now two weeks ago now um, and you did one in Worthing and it went pretty well from what I can gather yeah that's right well it, it started in an interesting way because I, I wasn't planning on doing any walks at the beginning of the year because I've been quite busy and then um, Aid got in touch with me and he said he was thinking of doing something in Worthing um, I thought, yeah, well, let's jump in and do something together. So, uh, and then he went and decided that he'd like to be there at 7 a.m. to catch the sunrise over the pier. And, uh, that's a bit earlier than I normally like to get up on a Saturday, but um, I thought that could, could be cool. So, what I did was um, suggest that we have two start times. So, we have a 7 a.m. for the sunrise and then a 10 a.m. second start where other people could join us, uh, more sane people um, who could join us and get up on a Saturday morning. Um, at a reasonable time so uh, that was an interesting uh, shoot I mean it started at 7am I was it was what I live on Shoreham Beach so it's a little peninsula on the south coast and to get to the mainland to get to the mainland it's only about a 20 metre bridge but you have to get over it to get to the railway station and for some reason it was closed that morning so I was in a mad panic to get to the station it was I mean it was night basically it was pitch black um, got to the pier. Um, I was the first one there, and I was thinking, Jesus, what the hell am I doing here? There's not even a coffee shop open yet. Um, and then, um, quite interestingly, about seven people turned up for the 7 a.m. Uh, moment. Um, it was fun because it was overcast, so there wasn't really a sun to see rising. But to be honest, it was really lovely just to see that <laughs> see some light emerge um, over the horizon because it, it was so dark and cold. And then um, we had a good old wander around um, the uh, lovely sights of Worthing, of, of which there aren't much. I mean, the, the sea there is fantastic. <laughs> you, organi- but- <laughs> you organize a walk around a place where there's not much to see. <laughs> well, I-, I thought it'd be cool because it was it was AIDS' idea um, to try Worthing. And I thought, why not? I've never done a walk there. And normally I do uh, Brighton walks because um, it's nearer to me. And also it's a lot easier um, in terms of street photography or a type of street photography I, I would say um, so Worthing was an interesting challenge in that firstly it's not as big and sprawling as Brighton um, we had uh, probably about 14 people turn up in the end um, so a nice bunch of us and there's not loads to see in Worthing um, so 
once the pier walk bit was over in the morning and then I sort of took over from 10 o'clock, I had to really have a good think about where we were going to go and made sure we weren't, you know, if anything, the challenge was to just keep everyone busy and weaving around streets and trying out little corners and things. And it worked out really well in that um, for a start over, overlooking um, the sea in Worthing and Worthing Lido um, is an amazing sort of brutalist 70s car park. Um, and it's just, just a big ominous chunk of concrete uh, with these really big geometric holes where you can look out over the sea. But outside the front of it is this sort of just flat sort of, uh, I don't know what you call it, apron of land. And it turned out that in the afternoon when the sun came out, it was a really bright day. There was a, a whole bunch of lads just uh, hanging around there, teenage boys listening to their grime music, trying to in- impress the bunch of little teenage girls who were sort of sat close to them, but not close enough. It was a, you know anthropologist dream. Um, and But these guys um, all had their mountain bikes and they were doing wheelies. So we had this lovely flat piece of land with this lovely stark block of a building behind, bright sunlight, and these kids in their threes and fours doing, going up and down the strip doing wheelies together. And we got talking to them and they, they you know, we started controlling them a bit and let, told them when to go. And so everyone got some really nice shots there. Also in Worthing, there's a museum. And um, I love local little town museums because they're always a bit crappy and fun in their own way. But what was cool was there was an exhibition of uh, coastal photography uh, from a woman. I've forgotten her name. I think it was Sarah Williams. But they were lovely shots. Um, what they... I think they were shot in a place called the Witterings, which is on in West Sussex. And the Witterings is interesting because it's the first bit of sand you start to get from when you go west of Brighton. But also when the tide is low, you can, I mean, you can walk out for probably uh, half a mile. Um, and the water is, you know, between ankle and knee height. So you, it, it's really eerie and dreamlike. So the, the, the photography in this exhibition featured photographs that this woman had taken from a quite a high aerial perspective of just rows of people just walking into the sea and nothing else. And it was really strange because these people were fully clothed, but they almost looked like some weird death cult who were just wandering off into the sea. And, but the, the point was they were walking so, at such a distance. You expect the sea to get deeper as you go into it, but it wasn't. Um, so it was just a, re- a really nice selection of shots, well-framed uh, and interesting to look at. So that took up a bit of time. And then I had, obviously, we had some pub stops and there's lots of nice craft beer places in Worthing. And a friend of mine had opened a a bottle shop, so we ended up there as well. So it it was a pretty good day. Um, It it was a good day for Worthing. And I think one of the challenges with Worthing is, is that it's not Brighton. And by that, I mean Brighton is great because I almost imagine Brighton for street photography of all types is great because it's like the whole city is like, a cool part of London that where they don't mind you doing street photography, like I would say Soho or Carnaby street where people are in a positive mindset that they're looking around. They expect cool shit to be going on around them. Whereas Worthing is a bit of a South coast, uh, granny pensioner town, a little bit down in the dumps. And, you know, it's, the people there, I, I call it suspicious. You, you get areas where yeah. you walk around with a camera, people get suspicious. So I, you know, I took a few street shots, but luckily there was enough coastal stuff to shoot. And also I just wasn't in the mood to get into it with anybody uh, and take that risk or bother. So I got a few street portraits, but generally most people were happy shooting architecture, um, the water and light and shadow and things. Um, and, you know, if there was, if there was anyone with me who wanted to st- try street photography you know for the first time i probably wouldn't have recommended that as a place simply because it is a kind of place where you know choose the wrong person you'll get a crowd of idiots around you and you can get smack in the mouth um or equally you just end up with loads of people saying no and that's a more likely thing to happen and they will they what happens is then it just puts you off it you know um because street photography is so dependent upon your confidence a lot of the time um and you know if you have positive experiences it spurs you on to push yourself into other places whereas if you start and try it out in a place where it's just not conducive in the first place uh it can just affect your view on how you do it in future um, so, so looking yeah. at a map uh on google maps yeah worthing seems to be sandwiched in between a place called lansing and a place called goring by sea so it sounds like what you're saying is those 
places are named after what they do to street photographers sometimes. Uh, I would say yes, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, was, it was a good day. And um, I know there was one going on in Oxford, and apparently we were competing. Um, that's, but that's, we had chips. That's, and we had a beach. Oops, so I was, I think, on, I was uh, on I think we won. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> there, there was a, there was a bit of competition going on, largely because of Graham Jago of the of the of the uh, sort of sixteen podcast, um, sort of um, tweeting out as or uh, sort of making it well known that uh, there were more people in Oxford uh, than there were at Worthing. I mean, there was twenty two versus um, was it fourteen you got in the end? Yeah, we got about fourteen. Which was good for Worthing, actually. Oh, I've just realised I've just been talking over it and I was muted. Oh dear. <laughs> um, do we do we just want to go back a little bit because that that's going to sound absolutely awful, isn't it? Sure. No, I I, I heard I you. Heard you. Yeah, we oh, okay. heard, we oh, heard okay. you, Simon. That's good yeah. because I couldn't hear myself at one point, so it's just really odd. So uh, okay, we'll just gloss <laughs> over that and just um, just pretend that yeah. that was absolutely fine. <laughs> You're not supposed to be able to hear yourself. Yeah, you know what I mean, anyway. But I, 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 wasn't, getting, I wasn't getting any kind of reactions, and I, yeah, which is sometimes when I do try try and say something funny, and I think to myself that wasn't that good, and then you two, everyone else just goes completely silent, and the tumbleweeds come across. Yeah, but I thought it was, it, I was thinking it wasn't really one of those moments, was it? <laughs> You're good. Well, now you've done it, Simon. Well, you killed that now, Simon. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> this conversation has come to an abrupt halt. <laughs> well, that was uh, episode 209 of this. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for being here, Arnold. <laughs> So where were we going? We were going talking about Oxford, weren't we? Uh, well, we we were. Although to be fair, we we, we talked quite a bit about Oxford uh, last yeah. week, and that was a that was a that was a really really good walk. And it's it's great that uh, you had a, a good walk out there. I mean, you you mentioned quite a few things about what uh, what you did out there, and uh, when you mentioned about those um, those young people with uh, BMX bikes and things like that, I was thinking, I hope he's I hope he's going to say that you know they got in, they started to talk to him and they and they engaged with him to get some get some photos and uh, which is exactly what happened so i'm really looking forward to seeing those images come out yeah that i mean that was a classic for me that was again I, as i said earlier that was an anthropologist's dream uh because they those the guys were showing off to the girls who were sat there you know you see it in every city center of in any country around the world you'll see guys hanging around showing off in one way or another and you'll see a bunch of girls sitting there sort of watching them and giggling away wanting to be impressed and so in a situation like that it was clear that you know if i went up to them i had a chat or you know we started watching them it, it spurred them on and they were enjoying it and we were having a good time uh photographing them so it was it was, it was really nice to uh, that that was one of those classic things of that i love in street photography is that you turn a corner and suddenly you come across something and for me, it's that no nothing ventured, nothing gained thing. You know, um, if we hadn't had gone that way, we wouldn't have seen it. But that took, you know, we spent a good 30, 40 minutes there. Um, and the people on the walk have started to post the shots they took uh, from there. I'm still waiting for mine because oh, this is my other problem at the moment. I, I went through this whole period of, well, well, I'm sure we'll talk about it later. I've been shooting a lot more digital, but I... I've suddenly got back into shooting lots of films. So I've now got about 20 roles waiting to be oh, yeah. developed and scanned, you know, going back for about God knows how long. Um, so I'm waiting. I'm going to have to sort all that out and see what kind of shots I got. Um, but that, that part of that um, whole process was I, I pulled out my Nikon FM3A. I took that for the day, but I hadn't used it for a while. And it's, it's like that thing of, you know, when you're, from going from um, i've never driven an automatic but i imagine if you're driving an automatic and then you go to stick shift and you go just there's that little mental play of okay i'm doing this i'm doing that and this is how i do x y and z um the the thing with the fm3a is with the shutter uh, winding uh, lever if it's pressed fully in it, the, essentially the camera's off it's locked mm -hmm. and i kept forgetting because i've been so used to miami super oh you just wind it and shoot and so I'd set up for the perfect shot and I'd suddenly remember I had to unlock the thing and then it was too late. Um, so it took me a while to get back into yeah. um, the, the swing of that camera. Um, and part of me was like, oh God, I just wish I'd brought my D850. <laughs> I would have got a, a hundred shots. In fact, I did have it. I, I did have it actually, but it was in the bag, but I had one camera out, but I, I didn't want to switch over. But um, again, that's all the joy of film, right, fellas? Well, yeah. here's, here's the thing. Yeah, you're, you're out there. You're an accomplished street photographer. 
and you you regularly break the street photographer's law by using an SLR camera. How how can that be? How can you get good photographs, street photos, with an SLR camera? Because everybody knows you have to use a rangefinder or especially a Leica. Uh, well, I, I think that's all bullshit because uh, <laughs> I, I think with a rangefinder, I think obviously you depending upon what lens you're using, you have the area outside of your field of view. Um, you know, outside of your frame lines that you can see within a shot so you can sort of capture that moment. But frankly, it depends where you are because I was standing in, in, in right in the middle of these guys. I stood in their path, so they actually wheelied either side past me. So I was smack in the middle of them. And if I had a range find, I'd be dicking around with that for ages. Whereas, annoyingly, if I'd had my Pentax ME Super with my 51.7, which I've, it feels so instinctive to me, I could just focus very quickly. And I like to... I love rangefinders because they're such cool cameras, but I've also realized that I, for me, the SLR and just actually seeing exactly what I'm going to get or seeing something hit focus makes me feel one bit less removed from reality than a rangefinder where you have to having to just assume and trust in those frame lines to know that it's in focus, in, uh, trust on the patch. Um, and so for the kind of way I shoot, um, I'm, I'm more likely in that situation to use um an slr so you mentioned that you guys like convince these kids to basically do stuff you know pose for you guys and ride for you guys to take shots yeah so in the sense that they were doing it anyway and then right. we came along and what we said that oh guys could you all do it all three together and did then... anyone yes we're going no that was it yeah yeah did anyone have um because the first thing that comes to mind in, in that kind of scenario is did anyone have like an uber wide lens uh, and get like right down to the ground and have, one, have someone do a wheelie right over them? Because that would be uh, a badass shot with uh, some backlight. I think I was the only one who decided to get in the middle of them. Because <laughs> uh, when kids on them, they weren't on BMXs either. They were on mountain bikes, so they've got less control. So if one of those things fell on you, uh, you know, I tried to get as low as possible. Um, and quite a few of the people were shooting quite wide, uh, but um, they stayed in a more sane position. Um, so I was the only one who sort of went in and, and amongst them. But again, if I'd had my DSLR set up, I'd be in there and I'd be... You know, I'd, I'd have hundreds of shots, but I didn't. <laughs> oh man, that's cool. Yeah, you know, it's, it, it's interesting because you know some of the stuff I've been shooting recently. I've been shooting a lot with a twenty-eight, um, often on digital on my Ricoh GR point and shoot because it. I'm trying to force myself to play angles a little bit more. Yeah. So when you were describing that scenario, I was just thinking like, man, the one shot that would totally. Uh, that I would totally want to make is I would just get straight on the ground, you know. Well, but you know, yeah, dying is a bad outcome. Of <laughs> but that—that's the camera I'm missing. Uh, it's not the GR2, but uh, this is going back to you know, uh, it, it breaks my heart. I—I I bought a Fuji X70 when they first came out, mm -hmm. and that's the only camera. That camera got me a five-page published spread in black, black and white photography magazine of nice. a project I did with it, and. Um, I loved it. A great lens, 28 mil equivalent, and yeah. uh, it was small and quiet, but it had this beautiful way that it visualized your um, depth of field, um, you know, your, your zone, if you like, what was in the focus and what was out, out based upon what f-stop you were at. And what. So I used to just walk around with it um, sort of as if my hand was loose, just uh, on the floor, so just around my hip. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't mm -hmm. even be looking at it, and I'd be—I can walk past people, and I got really good at just cracking away shots because the camera was totally silent, and no one knew I was shooting because it was. Black. Oh, I shoot like that with the GR all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah awesome. the small form factor, and it was great. But then um, I was umming and ahhing about the GR2, so then I sold it and decided to get a GR2, and then I got, as you do on Facebook, you go down a rabbit hole. A rabbit hole. I found a Facebook group where everyone, all the GR2 owners, were moaning about the dust problem on the sensor. And because the design of the camera, you can't open right. it up and clear the dust. So by the time my GR2 arrived, I sent it straight back, got a refund. And, and I thought, you know what, I'll wait for the GR3. So then I waited about, what, a year and a half? And Man. the GR3 turned up, and it was stupidly expensive for what it was. Yeah. 24 megapixels, fair enough, but still the dust sensor issue and no flash. So suddenly... I wanted to go back two steps and get my X70, which now is, they, those cameras are now selling for more than they were originally on the market for. Well, if it's, it makes you feel crazy. any better, if yeah. it makes you feel any better, people have figured out how to do this, and there's at least one repair guy in Hong Kong who will 
uh, de dust a Rico GR2 for the equivalent of like 10 pounds. Okay, well, that's good to know. Um, but then I, I've, I've started to also through my digital journey, I've, I've become a bit resolution hungry because, oh. um, and that's why the XF10 appeals to me potentially, uh, because the fact that you can crop into things and not lose quality and yeah. Uh, again, it just suits my. Also, part of me is just a little bit suspicious of. I, I, I know the Fuji has its own um, array in the way its sensors work, and sometimes I like it, and sometimes I don't. I, Whereas, I, yeah, I, the, I don't think that camera has an X trans sensor, though. No, the XF10 doesn't. Yeah, but the X70. The 70 did. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the XF10. Yeah. That's what appeals to me about the XF10 is that I think that it would have a bit more latitude. Yeah, uh, to play yeah, with, I think so. uh, with the raw files. Yeah, um, as long as you don't need the the tilty screen because it. Oh, I don't give that. a damn about the screen. Okay, yeah. I, I wouldn't I, even use it. I need, don't even use autofocus when I use yeah, these things. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's 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 sort of like a um. I don't want to call it a cheapened down version of the seventy, but it kind of is. Yeah, it's but got it's, the same it's, lens. Yeah, it's no worse than the GR3, and it actually has a flash, so there you go. <laughs> yeah, and then, well, this is the problem. Then I looked at the GR3, and I thought, wow, 800 pounds. Yeah, it's crazy. And then, But then that's <laughs> the same price as now of Fuji X-Pro2. Yeah. And, and all, crazy. the yeah. dust problem on the GR2 is not that big of a problem. Um, when you read online, every single camera yeah. sounds like it's going to die the next time you're going to use it, right? And I do look after, you know, <laughs> a camera like that, I'd always have it in a case and things. I'd, I look after my kit, but um, it would just annoy me. Dude, um, I just keep mine in my pocket all the time, and I there's maybe one speck of dust from years of use in, right. in the sensor. Okay. And I, you can only see it if I'm at, like, F16, which is never. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 I think it's all good. But but then on that front, I've been getting really good at just using my Nikon D850, which is a big monster of a camera. Uh, with, mm. I, put, I put the 24 uh, mil oh, yeah, on fair. it. And then I just, again, walk around with that just at hip height. And because the width of the shot and the, you know, I can crop the hell into things and find moments that, that really work. And the, the image quality is stunning. So... Uh, basically, I think I'm just looking for an excuse to buy another camera, guys. So, yeah, dude, there, <laughs> we, we, there we, is, we're glad to encourage you with that. <laughs> well, I'll be yeah, that. on the right show. There yeah. is um, there's a feature on the GR2. You know, the way that you said you'd like to shoot the X70 yeah. um, with it, with the sort of Fuji depth of field scale. Oh, there's a feature focus. on the GR2. Uh, well, yeah, snap focus, which I think they now have on the X Pro 3 and the X100 V. Am I right about that or am I wrong? I'm not sure, but I, I do. What I loved about the Fujis was the way it visualized your scale, the, the distance. It, yeah, the little be, thing on the bottom, right? Yeah, a little sort of yeah. digital ready reckoner that just just readjusted every time you change your f stop. Oh, it's um, wonderful, and it's so instinctive and, and so nice to use. So, yeah, I think I'm oh, I, I'm going to have to pull the trigger on something at the moment at some point. But uh, well, in our pre uh, in our pre recording chat. When you were describing all the things you like and don't like about a camera, like op- you need an optical viewfinder, blah 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 blah, it sounds like an X Pro Two is the one that's singing to you. But the, I, I, the, the problem with that is the size, and this is my thing. I think I'm, yeah. well. I think there's yeah. two stories here. I think I've there's the, something I want to buy at some point for adapting for mirrorless, uh, mm. for, for adapting my classic lenses. But something tiny. In fact, at one point, I was actually looking at uh, Sony make a tiny. I think it's like two inch square cube. It's an RX V. It's basically got a Zeiss 28 mil equivalent lens on it. It's like a GoPro kind of thing. Oh, that thing. But yeah, it, yeah. Shoots, it shoots 16 megapixel stills. And to the point that I could almost wear it like a badge or even have a fake broken arm cast and <laughs> in, embed it. In, I, 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 I kid you not. I kid you not. And, and I've, I've become these I'd sneaky ideas. I could just get right up to people because the, the shots I got with the X70, the ones that made it into this magazine, what what was great about them is that they were so close, but they were, because it was a wide-angle lens and because I was low, people just filled the frames and they were looming yeah. down and everything mm. looked great. It looks and fantastic. I really, really like that. And I do like getting close like that, but I have to really be in the mood for it, you know, if I do it out and about. Because um, sometimes I just don't want any hassle if things don't work out. Um so, yeah, I, for me, I think the size thing's quite important. So it could well be, I may even just go, you know what, GR2. Um, 
So you're you're talking about the RX zero with the uh, the 24 millimeter f4 test. That's arc, it. Yeah, which is like a little GoPro thing, right? Yeah, it's a I tiny mean, thing, but it takes stills. It's got it takes a memory card, and it's all waterproof. And but it, it's just tiny. And I thought, you know what? This why aren't people looking at this camera for street photography? Well, it's, it's absolutely perfect. But I mean, it's there, there's two different ways to go there, right? Because the method of shooting you're describing, I mean, I've done it and the, the results are super cool, but you can also get those results by just, you know, sucking it up and getting down and looking through the viewfinder. It'll put people off, uh, but... But this is my point. Yeah, it changes how you interact with people. I, I like the fact yeah. that I could walk up to people uh, and my trick would be I'd wear I'd usually a bright hat or a scarf or something. So looking at that and I'll just you know, put my hand to my head or just do a physical distracted move or look, look in no. another direction <laughs> and then <laughs> snap them when they're. No, you, you obviously need a monkey. Yeah, <laughs> you need a little you need a little cappuccino monkey who who does tricks while you're photographing people to keep now, them occupied. Now, there's yeah. a thought. Yeah. Yeah. I, I bet, I bet Graham has a monkey. Is there a Zeiss monkey I could buy? I don't know, but I bet I bet Graham has one, so that means you should have one. Oh, of course, yeah. Graham's got everything, <laughs> that Graham. <laughs> so, yeah, that walk went well. But, yeah, I'm, I'm still looking. And then um, I've been uh, playing again with I, – I, yes, the other thing I found was a, a Rolle 35E. So, oh, yeah. so it's one of those tiny Rolle 35s. I, um, I found it for two pounds in a charity shop. Nice. Ooh. Seems to be working. I've been using my. I haven't tested a, a roll yet, but uh, there's a roll in it. I've been using my iPhone, just a meter app, to sort of get a sense of the lighting um, and mucking around with that. That could be interesting. But again, it's one of those things that I'm not sure if I'm doing everything right with it. <laughs> you know, pull, is it then pulled out properly? Am I cocking it right? Um, is the order in which I do things correct? So for me, it's that it's that endless battle of finding a thing that I want to do what I want, but with the least amount of hassle because sometimes things get too complicated. You know, they might be the right size, but the, the workflow just to get to do the thing is a pain. And the closest I've ever got is that Fuji X70. So, and I know there's things out there uh-huh. um, that can do that, uh, including the Fuji X70. <laughs> and I've actually been <laughs> buying yeah. it again. Um, but no, I couldn't do that because I'd hate myself. So, Wait, uh, Why did you get rid of it again? I, I got rid of it because I wanted to get a GR2. Oh, right. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, so the, this whole stupid round circular mission, which is ended, <laughs> I've ended up with nothing, is really really daft. Yeah, yeah. You know, the monkey that wants the, the the food in the jar and puts its hand in and grabs it, and because its fist is closed now, it can't get out of the jar, so it has to let go again. It's like, That's me. And the monkey so, with the jar. So is the X100 series also a little too big for what you are looking yeah. at? Even though I've been in, <laughs> they've interested me in their own way. Uh, They're so nice. To, yeah, to pay that for a sort of you know, fixed lens thing at that size, I don't know. I've got lots of other bits like that. So, mm-hmm. um, But then that, that takes me on to the whole the mirrorless camera for which to adapt my other lenses. Because I've got, I've got, wow, I've got a whole bunch of sort of, not loads, but I've got some interesting uh, M42 lenses. Um, and... I've been looking at the Sony A6000, which has dropped in price massively. Mm. Um, my problem is I buy something and then I wish it had that bit more functionality or was that bit better. And so I've started to think now maybe it's the Fuji um, X-Pro2, which I've always lusted after. I think that's a beautiful camera. And it's got the Acros um, film simulation, which I love. Yeah. Um, and also because it's got that hybrid viewfinder, which I find really exciting the fact that you're looking out into the real world but then there is a digital overlay um you feel like a an apache helicopter pilot and i think that that, (laughs) that's just a i don't know why more people don't do that because i hate Mm. a totally digital viewfinder i I just can't stand them it's like watching tv and for me it's almost takes away from the joy of what photography is i want to see the real world through my viewfinder and I know they're really good quality now. I know that lags are, you know, the lag that, you know, some cameras black out a bit when you take the shot, that's going. But I still feel that bit removed. And that is that same rangefinder effect. You know, I want to see what I'm seeing. Um, yeah. So I, th- I think at the moment for me, it could be the X-Pro2. But for me, it's that whole thing of the, what do you call it? How, how they focus uh, to show you're in focus. There's lines come up, don't they, on edges of things digitally oh focus peaking 
Yeah, focus peaking, um, mm-hmm. and that has it. And I think the A6000 has it, but I, I'm not a fan of looking at a big screen whilst I'm doing that. Yeah, but I, this, right. this, I'm not sure if the X-Pro2 is different from the one, but I don't think that the hybrid viewfinder, I think that only, am I right and think that only works with native Fuji lenses? No, 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 no. It's, not, it's, not, it's good with anything, man. Dude, yeah. the viewfinder is genius design because you can also do the little uh, viewfinder within the viewfinder. Yeah, where you get the little tiny EVF in the bottom right that's a zoomed in view with focus peaking for your precise focus. And then you get the overlay. But when you're adapting lenses, um, you just specify the focal length of your lens. And then like, you know, it, it changes the magnification and the frame lines and everything is great. I, I think that's one thing they've so nailed so well. And it's the wonderful. thing that, thing that yeah. annoys me about Fuji, they, they just come out with so many models. It gets so confusing. There's, so there's, only, there's only there's three. There's only three models of that oh, camera, yeah. and we're going back to what? No, not just the X Pro. It's that that whole world. I think there are just so many overlaps between their different models and the way they've laid things out. And it, I, you know, no, nah, I don't nah, know. They're, 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 they don't. They don't. They only have two cameras that do that. One is the X Pro, and one is the X One Hundred. You know what I mean? They're yeah. the only only right. two that have that view, that style of viewfinder. Exactly. You know, I'm, I'm talking about their range in general. Yeah, yeah, but then th- that that's depending on the kind of camera. So you're talking about like the XE3, yeah, and the XT30, XA5s, and the XA. That's and the that's XCs cool. Well, I mean, there's the ones without the viewfinder, so screw those. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. Like, I, yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's great because. I mean, I yeah. know it makes sense that like, they essentially a lot of the time build the same camera just in two different shapes. Here you go. Here's this functionality. This is a rangefinder style. This is an SLR style. I think that's great because it's not like yeah. Sony who who releases like ten thousand different models that are basically the same, right? Right, and they update it every month. Fuji has like a few clear differentiated product lines that they update via firmware, and it's and then every couple of years they just come up with a new model, and I, I, it makes sense to me. Yeah, I, I've I've I end up going down just getting really confused and you know you, you think oh this one's nearly like that one but it's just missing that bit which one should i get and i just end up oh my god stop it stop it everybody uh, well if you want a company that uh, restricts your choices there is always like a <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've uh, i can't afford that i'm afraid <laughs> well, no you, you know you, yeah i mean like i so missed the boat in terms of viewfinder i i feel for their digital cameras that they're not doing the yeah. sort of thing fuji's doing with uh, yeah hybrid ovf i mean it just I, it's just yeah. it's so it's so good <laughs> yeah and 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 to be fair you know like the the cl and the sl are really nice and the q are really nice yeah, viewfinder wise who's, are. who's buying those things yeah i mean you know is it like a q or a fuji x100 i know which one i'd get you oh, know, definitely x100 yeah i mean geez you could buy two of them at the same price you in fact you could key- buy an x100 and a Leica film camera for the to, to be fair, the Q is <laughs> the Q is really freaking nice. It, um, yeah, it really it's is. It's so nice. It's just really right. expensive. Yeah. Uh, and it's big. But it, it, yeah. in terms of user experience, they've knocked it out of the park with that one. Yeah. Yeah. If it had a yeah. 100 style viewfinder, I I, I think I'm. It, w- it would be the, the perfect camera. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Anyway, I, I was going to say just just to put in there about you know uh, which which uh, camera to 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 go for. It, it's largely going to be down to the kind of photography you you want to do. And yeah. the, the other the other thing is that you say like you don't like EVFs, and really that that, that for for me using a, a mirrorless camera with old lenses the. The, 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 what makes them worthwhile doing is because of the EVF. And mm-hmm. if you, you know, a poor EVF uh, makes it difficult uh, to use um, manual focus lenses. I do not like uh, to use my X Pro One largely because I'm, I'm, I'm not particularly impressed with the, the EVF on it. Um, I know they've got better, and I think it is better on the, on the X Pro Two. Um, but if that EVF was better on the X Pro One, I would actually, I would probably almost certainly use that camera more because I like the camera in in most ways. So, yeah. so you know, really, for me, you, I, I would be looking at quality of EVF as almost being your first consideration. Okay, well let's let's break this down for our listeners, guys. Okay, if I had say, okay, tops eight hundred pounds, and what I'm after is a relatively compact mirrorless camera. On which I can adapt lenses, uh, 
with a good which has a good way of doing focus peaking and focusing and bloody blah and all that stuff what would each of you recommend Wait, so is your primary goal with this to adapt lenses or to shoot street in the way that you were describing right. with the well, I, I think, that's the, that's I think that's my like street thing is a, yeah there's two things here i think my street thing is it's uh, i've already worked that one out is that's either going to be um a gr2 or a gr3 or an xf10 okay but so now i'm talking adapting. adapting lenses and i think my primary thing would be less uh, more portraits and close-up work so i'm less likely to be stopped down majorly i'd be shooting at probably f4 to f1.4 do do you care about full frame in an ideal world i'd want full frame because i like that control and i like grading i like just the space um so uh, yeah yeah i mean you know if it was possible to have full frame that'd be great but i just think something with really decent raw files could just a good quality of output that I can use professionally. Okay. My recommendations would be an X-T2 or a uh, A7R2. Uh, what, for that price? Yeah, you can get A7R2s for around 800 pounds. X-T2 easily. Okay. Yeah, you used one, no problem. Yeah. I'm, Johnny, I'm, would you agree? I'm going to say, I'm, I'm surprised that you can get an A7R2 for 800 pounds. But I'm, I'm, is, that, is that secondhand? Yeah, secondhand. Oh, yeah, secondhand, definitely. Yeah. Okay, I'm thinking yeah. new because oh. I, I don't like buying secondhand digital. Uh, A7 II or uh, still XT2. That view, yeah. the EVF and focus peaking on the XT2 is so good. I think and the viewfinder need, I, is huge. I don't know in that price though. I think you'd have to go to like a an X an XE3 probably. You could get a brand new XE3 for that. You can get an XT2 or new like new old stockish for less than 800 pounds. Easy. Oh, 800 pounds. Okay. Yeah. 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 Totally. Yeah. yeah. Not an XE3, but like, who cares? Johnny, were you thinking dollars? Because you realize I was, the English, English pound is probably worth a lot well, less than it's, your American it's, dollar it's, now. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, it's, I, is it still worth anything? I, I don't know. I just, it's, it's basically 800 pounds is basically $1,000. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Simon? Um, there's no contest. It's uh, A7 Mark II. Um, and you can definitely get one for £800 or less. I'm looking at one on eBay for 710 at the moment. Uh, okay. Brand new inbox, UK stock warranty and so on and so on. Wow. So, um, so yeah. So, so no X-Pro 2s out there? Uh, I don't think, uh, not a new one, I would have thought. The price does not drop on those damn things. That's 799, no, brand new. They, they don't go down. Seven <laughs> with... Seven nine nine, brand new. But uh, okay, so X Pro Two. Um, I'm going to say two things about it because the shooting experience is wonderful, right? Um, I I want that camera on paper, but there's two things that put me off of that camera. A, it's a little bit wider, which I, I just find slightly uncomfortably large. Um, B, I really don't like the diagonal edge on it. I think it's ugly, but that that's totally irrelevant. Uh, but I think the viewfinder <laughs> magnification is so much smaller than an X-T2 that when I use the two side by side, um, you know, I far prefer the rangefinder styling of camera. But mm. I, I, when I, I, I used to have an X-T2 for the longest time. And for me, it was no contest when I used them hand in hand because the X-T2 viewfinder, uh, even though the experience is not as nice, I far preferred it to the X-Pro2. And to me, the best way to shoot an X-Pro2 uh, is to get an X-100. And just don't worry about other lenses. Yeah, I, far better that, experience. That was a, what was about to come out of my mouth too. Just get an X100 and be done with it. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, it's like it's 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 a damn near perfect camera. Also, the but same I, way the like can't change the lenses on that though. No, so what? Yeah, so what? <laughs> so my M42 <M40s> will <laughs> now be gathering even more dust, and, uh, getting even more fungus. It, it really annoyed me. I, I I've had them in a, a cupboard that was uh, in my in my office, and I thought I'd get them out. I've recently rearrange my office and i started looking through and i realized some of them are starting to get those sort of evil strands of mm. uh, fungus in them and i thought oh jesus christ i've just got to use these things before they die or before i decide myself to open them up and destroy them um, <laughs> so I've, I've got to do something with them and i don't want to go oh. down the film camera route and adapting and all that stuff it's just yeah okay so let's let's try to get this settled simon a7 mark ii versus xt2 
in uh, in this corner of the ring we have Simon Forster on the Sony side. Without I'm going to take yeah. the Fuji side. I, go I, okay, well, the, oh, go on, John. <laughs> John, yeah. I was going to say just flip a coin. Yeah, I mean, either either one will do it. it, it pick, no, no, pick, but, the, <laughs> pick the one that's going to uh, that has the the user interface that you like the most in which case here's, it won't be sony that was a well, that was a roundabout way to try to be yeah to, to try to be fair but be totally unfair and the fuji yeah. has a film simulation so that's right the, love. the sony is nice on paper but it will piss you off oh, I know. um so I, I have both right i use my sony for one thing it's dicking around if i want to do actual photography digitally with adapted lenses it's the fuji 100 percent of the time because it's just a far better user experience, and then you just right. forget about the fact that it's a crop sensor. I, I, I was on a pro shoot uh, uh, late last week, and I was doing um, sort of reportage stuff around the shoot, but the, the main photographer, a uh, pro photographer, he was using a, a Nikon D810 as his main camera, but then every now and then he'd pull out his uh, A7 R Mark III, whatever. He had this enormous uh, G Master lens, and that's lovely glass, but this he hated it. He hated yeah. it. He loved the yeah. lenses, yeah. but the menus and the, the, just the whole work around the experience of using the thing drove him crazy. Yeah. I, right. I don't understand in this day and age when there's so many, so much amazing user experience design out there that Sony still yeah. design their stuff the way they did. So what, cause on the shoot, there was a, a camera up, up as well. And they were saying there was a whole legacy thing and it came from the world of, um, video cameras um the way people were used to shooting video so when when sony wanted to get people to start shooting video with their um film ca- with their digital cameras and not their video cameras uh they kept a similar menu system just to ease people in because there was this whole history because the the uh canon 5d mark ii you know just killed it and changed the landscape of what dslrs could do when people started shooting with it right um, and to sort of get an edge into that market, Sony just thought, okay, well, let's use a similar way that the users of the Sony cameras, uh, TV cameras, would work and in, and use it within our um, stills cameras so that they can shoot video that way. But, but that makes even less sense because... I know. Like, the placement of, <laughs> know. The, 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 placement of the record button is in the most <laughs> stupid place. It's on the outside of the thumb grip, which is like... This, you can't press there without removing your right hand from the camera. It's um, funny. Whereas the Fuji was designed by people, you know, who understand actual photography. They know how to make cameras. Um, they got at least one person on their design team who in an interview recently basically said that he hates digital cameras. Yeah. Um, and you can see that in the way that they make the camera. They are a joy to use. Well, whereas this... the Sony, sorry, let me finish this rant. Yeah. Whereas the Sony is the most powerful <laughs> camera and the best camera I have ever owned both in terms of its functionality, its features, and its image quality. And I have never hated a camera more than this piece of shit. You know, <laughs> its battery life sucks. It handles like a piece of crap. And, like, give me a real camera that does everything that the Sony does, and it'll be fantastic. Sorry. Right. Yeah, I, I think Sony, <laughs> Sony, what they've done is that Sony, you know, in that post-Walkman era, they they went, uh, well, they've always been known for it, and that's how they built their brand through miniaturization. So they, they always seem to put that first to the point where, it becomes unusable. And I, I was having this discussion on set with these, this, this uh, photographer. It was like, right, you've got this camera, and yeah, great, it's small. By the time you put everything on it that you need, it's all top-heavy. It doesn't balance out. Mm-hmm. And, you know, then I would, you know, I had my D850 out. He, he had his D810 out. We were just saying, look, the, I, I, and it's the same with, actually, with video cameras now. When you go on set, these cameras are becoming so compact, they're now having to add bits on and weights and balances and counterweights. Yeah. So yeah. That it actually sits on your shoulders. So when I used to work in TV back in the day, back in the 90s, you'd have a Sony Beta Cam, a Digi Beta Camera, big, heavy f***ers that sit on your shoulder. Now, there's there's two reasons. Like, hey, hey obviously, you know, they were, you were shooting to tape, so it had to be that big to house all the, the stuff inside. But... When you're holding a camera, you don't want something so light and flimsy that, you know, if you, by, every time you breathe, it's moving, that the weight actually helps. And that's what I love about actually having a camera with a bit of heft to it because it balances you out. And so when mm-hmm. you press a shutter, the weight of it sort of and the, the mass of this camera absorbs any movement. Whereas when you get small, you move anything or click anything, it, the whole camera turns or it wobbles a bit. And that's a really big deal when you're on a big shoot. 
Yeah. You know, um, when you're starting to having to zoom into shops and crop and check all those details, you can really tell. So in a way, and that's my, you know, I get why mirrorless is coming to the fore now, but I like the form factor and the size and the weight of an SLR. And I think, for example, the Sony S, is it the Panasonic SR series, uh, mm. their new mirrorless cameras, they seem to get it right because they're bigger and a bit heftier. They look just solid and more reliable. And I think that I'd imagine the user experience of holding something like that makes you more confident. Whereas by the time you put stuff on a Sony, Jesus, it, it just looks ridiculous. Yeah. You know, it's not good in the hand. Okay. Am I, am I allowed to talk now? <laughs> Go on then. <laughs> because I've just been sitting here listening to a complete load of bollocks as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> it's absolute nonsense. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. F- first thing. Um, ergonomics and uh, no now let's go let's let's talk about the display and the the menus because and we've talked about this in in the past but I've clearly my what I whatever whatever I've said just doesn't seem to go into anybody else's head um, <laughs> and and that's a case of once you set your camera up there's hardly ever a reason to go into the menus that's the first thing and you've got custom buttons all over the place in good positions so that you can just set something up i have a button for peaking i have a button for uh, magnification i can i can get to iso far more easily than far easier than i can do on my x pro uh, it, it, it winds me up royally about how difficult well, it is to, to do that why don't you just set a button like you know yeah but so i've got a camera. button doing something else do well, you got do, like, do, do aren't enough custom buttons? There aren't enough buttons. I got it. Okay. Yeah, needs more buttons. Those people like like Hamish Gill <laughs> who moan about it's got too many buttons. I don't like it. I don't care. Just don't. Just ignore the buttons. Use the but if you don't want to use the buttons, you don't have to. You haven't got to assign things if you don't want to. And those of us that actually like yeah. to actually have direct access to things, we can assign things to them, and that makes us happy. So, until until you change one function that you have decided to experiment with, and unbeknownst to you, it disables some of the buttons as you've set up, <laughs> because Sony is so busy trying to stuff every feature in that they don't all work in tandem. And and then you know you change one setting because you're trying to play with video, and then it's disabled a bunch of your other crap. Well, don't do don't deal with video. You it, it, do stills. <laughs> I mean, who, 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 we shouldn't we shouldn't be talking about video on these things anyway. It's 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 stills anyway. So that's me being a dinosaur. But I, I think you're talking. There's there's two things. There's the uh, if you like the user interface, the UI. Um, but then there's then there's the beyond that. There's the ergonomics, if you like, the shape of the camera. And beyond that, there's just the form factor in a bigger sense in that balance of the thing. And yeah. The, you know. I, yeah. No. And that's fine. And I've written something down here. Get a grip. Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and quite quite literally now i've i've used when when i first had my sony i was still doing a lot of wildlife photography because that's what i used to do with my em1 and that's an even smaller camera than than uh than the, than the sony although it's actually not that much smaller and i was using by, by the time i finished doing that i was using 400 millimeter canon lenses uh, manual F, fd lenses in fact, my favorite lens that i was using was a 400 4.5 and I was using that on on the Olympus, and then I started using it on uh, my Sony. And you know, that's a big lens on a little body. Um, I just had a grip, and when I, when you've got a grip, it's just balanced right. You've got two batteries in there as well, so that if you have got a problem with uh, with with battery life, then that overcomes it. And and certainly in the case uh, the A seven R R two may well be a simple case of that that uses more batteries than the, than the basic uh, mm-hmm. two because my mine was not a problem at all um i've done oh dude yeah it's bad i carry six spare batteries with me because yeah. that thing sucks battery yeah. this is the other thing with miniaturization and i know you know my d850 i'll get i, I can shoot all day i take six batteries with me and i can't and i will shoot all day i'll crack off thousands of shots and i never even yeah. kill one battery yeah. can't kill one battery it's and that is camera. like that's mm-hmm. great yeah so i all, all of this just so i'm clear all of this is just so that you have a smaller alternative to the d850 more or less yeah no 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 <laughs> I, okay i i, 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 I think i've realized as, I, as my work is getting more as professional i suppose i've started to get more professional commissions uh my work has moved from tinkering and messing about and doing stuff for personal reasons to doing stuff that has a much higher quality threshold and expectation of quality and so i'm having to make sure that i've got the right bits for that um so i just want to sort of 
make sure I've, I yeah invest well if I if I go down this route and get something because yeah. clients love it. I, I when I'm on set and I pull out you know a digital camera or I've or the, I was on set. I had my contacts Aria with the Zeiss one point uh, fifty one point four and they love it. And you get a film camera out; it's really exciting for them. And obviously, I'm not going to do the whole shoot that way. But if you pull out a manual lens and you're talking to them, it, it's a story and it makes them feel it's something special and interesting. And it's a, just a nice bit of theatre to engage them as well right. make them think they're getting something interesting as to whether they can tell which of the shots you finally took was with that lens or the other but the point is yeah. it's a story well i i'm just gonna kind of go back to say just try try them both and pick the one that has the interface you like better and i'm not saying that that's necessarily <laughs> only gonna be the no that, that, that i mean it, you may be like simon in that there's one button in the wrong place and you can't figure out how to set your iso where you want and that blows the whole deal for you I don't well know. i i've i've tried the sony's but i just like the shape and the hold of any fuji camera of the sony's if i'm honest i, okay, I just yeah. think they yeah and, the, and there's an iso dial on the x pro too yeah and and there were I, I had by the way i know that uh, johnny was trying to get away from me talking because i hadn't actually finished um <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so so you've got the ability to get a chip grip and make the camera bigger if you need more balance with a larger lens that's 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 one thing but once once i moved away from using large lenses i haven't used my grip now for about two years i used to always use the grip now i rarely use the grip and that mean, and that's because i'm just using smaller lenses 50 millimeters and, and tends to be yeah. wider and it's a, and then all of a sudden it's a small camera it's a small full frame camera um that's that's very that's very easy to handle once you've got your head around how, how it works of course but the other the other big advantage and i'm not, I'm not trying to like do fuji down uh, well actually i am uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but no, the, um, because they, they, they just annoy me. Um, my cat, my Fuji annoys me and that's all there is to it. Um, but the, the other thing is, uh, if you do like shooting wide angle and you're using a crop center lens and you're using, um, c classic lenses, then you're going to start getting hampered on your, on your lens choice. Um, so you, you end up having to use a much larger lens. Oh um, no, no, no. Oh no, yes, no. yes. Uh, no, yes, not yes. unless you're trying to do shoot like 12 millimeters. No, 17 mil. If you want to, if you, I'm not saying, so if you, if you want to choose 24 mil, you're using a 17 mil lens and they're much bigger. No, they're not. What, what are you are. talking about? It depends on the lens. Sorry. You're Depends on the lens. It depends on the lens. I've got. Come on. 70, all seventy mil lenses are twice the size of a twenty-four at uh, two point eight. All, in fact, they're usually slower uh, because they're usually three point fives, aren't they? Anyway, I'm right, and you know I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Speaking of form factor, I'm going to move this conversation to something I discovered, which I um, excited me uh, in a very, very big way. So I was in a camera shop in Brighton. And just wandering around. And I saw a camera I'd never heard of before. And it's called the Ricoh KR10. Uh. And I'd never seen this thing before. The first thing that excited me was that the way KR10 was written, it looked like a Swiss font, looked like a Helvetica. Uh, it was a black camera. But then also immediately it hit me that the, the shape of it was incredibly similar to my Nikon FM3A and the sort of those Nikon cameras, uh, the mm -hmm. sort of body shape and size. Um, and then I realized that it um, was a Pentax K-mount. I'd never heard of this camera, so I picked it up and had a play, um, and I loved it. Um, so it's, you know, it's uh, got a lovely uh, needle inside showing you the meter. It's got aperture priority, and it goes to a thousandth of a second, and it was in absolutely mint condition. Um, and I love it. So I, I bought it, and I got it home, and I looked into it, and apparently it was made by uh, that C word you hate, Johnny, Casina. Yeah. No, I was um, just about to say you, you yeah. got yourself a fine a fine casino there. <laughs> but um and apparently it was what camera's camera of the year in nineteen eighty. But this thing is staggering. And what I what I don't understand is why more people don't rave about it, especially people entering film photography, because it's you know, I got this I uh, it's you can go full manual and you can go aperture aperture priority. Yeah. They're so easy to use. And I, I, one of my favorite lenses is the uh, Pentax 51.7. It's just the most easy and instinctive. I, in terms of ease of use and sort of user experience, it's up there for me anyway with my uh, Zeiss Planar 51.4. I just love the throw on it. 
I'm very fast at working with that lens and they make such a good combination and it just looks great. And um, I suggest yeah. everyone gets on eBay right now <laughs> and pumps the prices up. <laughs> Dude. It, it is really a lovely camera. It's uh, the top plate. I don't, I don't know what it's made of. It feels a bit plasticky, but it, it's solid. I mean, it's a solid looking thing and it's beautiful. And then when I looked at the top of it compared to my FM3A, everything was laid out in exactly the same mm-hmm. position. Yeah, it's because they're yeah. basically the same camera. Yeah. yeah. Simon, Simon is and, the one who and the doesn't FM3A like the FM3A has plenty of Casina made parts on it. So, yeah, well, mm-hmm. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> I can deal with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing wrong with Casina. Well, I nearly bought one of their others recently. I was telling you earlier the, uh, is it the Besser, uh, the Bessomatic? Okay, you, you you were talking about the Bessaflex and why yes. it also has a nice typeface. Yeah. But here's the difference between the font of the Rico and the Bessaflex. The Bessaflex is not in all caps, so it looks stupid in my opinion. Oh, I think it's beautiful. <laughs> it's really clean. But also, it's the shape above the pentaprism. It makes me think of a stealth the, fighter. Everything else about that camera, I agree. <laughs> I, I think it's beautiful, but the font looks like they typed it in, a, in, in Microsoft Word and forgot to change the font before they printed it onto the camera. <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I love about it. <laughs> At least they kerned it well. I mean, come on. You got to give them points. The kerning for, is for, nice. Yeah. <laughs> they could have yeah. totally messed that up. <laughs> it's so clean and crisp um, in design. It's, it's, it's a gorgeous thing. It has that lovely, the back, that sort of slight thumb grip area that I had on my um, uh, 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 Voigtlander Bessa R3A. Yeah, because it's the same. It's the same chassis. They're all. All these cameras are built on the same chassis. I'm cool with that. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Just badge it, rebadge it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They're 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 relatively new, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. It does the job, but um, yeah. I mean, have you guys ever come across this camera? Used one? Well, I I come across them quite often um, because they usually get dumped on me. Uh, Wow. Um, I've actually got one at the moment, which I've, I need to take a closer look at because I've, I, I picked it up a couple of weeks ago and shortly after you started uh, saying things on Twitter, uh, on Twitter about just how uh, wonderful the KR10s are. And I'm scratching my head and goes, really? really? The KR10? Are, you, are, you, are we talking about it's, the same camera here? It's because for me, it's, 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 coming, it's working backwards from two things that I love, which is my Pentax ME Supo, the 50 on it. Um, and then also my Nikon FM3A. It's like these two worlds have merged, and that that just blew yeah. my mind. I just thought, wow, this is this is really something interesting. You get a sort of Nikon user experience, and you've got all that Pentax glass, um, which is really nice and quite cheap as yeah. well. I, well, that 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 point you're making about the the, the set the the layout with Nikon, that's something I hadn't I hadn't picked up on at all, and uh, and I can see now. You know why that would increase the the interest in that, but I mean earlier on, uh, you sent us a picture of um, of that camera along with a, uh, a black ME Super and uh, some of the lenses that we, we we may get to talk about. And I'm just looking at the two of them, and I I think the the Pentax ME Super is a beautiful looking camera. I think it's mm-hmm. fan- fantastic. I, I'm I'm more drawn to that than say uh, the other small camera of its of a similar kind of uh, like yeah. the, uh, the the Olympus cameras the uh, the the single I, digit OMs. I bought an OM2N and it's the shutter's gone weird. I need to get it repaired. But the thing is, mm. I never used it. It felt too boxy. But I'll tell you something, that ME Super, mm. I, I ended up buying a second one. Uh, I may buy a third just to have a spare in case the two die. I love it that much. It is just so great in the hand, so compact. Exactly. And, and shutter speed to a 2,000th of a second as well. Oh, it's just, I didn't just, realize that. That's yeah. Cool. It is fantastic, yeah. and it's so quick to use. And I've, uh, I've finally got the forty mil two point eight pancake uh, to put on it. I I, I bought one oh, about nice. three three times off eBay, and oh. they they all had a bit of dirt or rubbish yeah. on them. And you know, one came without the the uh, knurled rubber bit around the focus, so you simply couldn't turn it. Well, Whatever. The, but finally, I got a super clean one. I was so. just going to say because I think it's worth just chatting about the lens. But let's just finish off where where I'm going with this, and and that's it's sitting next to the picture of the of the KR10, and I'm looking at the Pentax, and I'm seeing desire. I think that's lovely. And then then you look over at the at the Rico, and it's it's just a camera. Oh, I love the Rico. It's like if you went if you. If you go on Google and type in a uh, camera symbol <laughs> and you get a reduced down um, graphic design image, an icon of a camera, the Ricoh KR10 is kind of what they look like. They're just big. They've got a lovely yeah. box shape and they're just solid. And there's something about this that's like quite brutalist in that sense. Mm-hmm. And that's what I like about them. Yeah. Well, at the end of the day, 
cameras are light type boxes that take pictures and if they work they work so yeah uh, and if you like it that's the thing if you if, end of the day, if you're enjoying using the using a piece of equipment then you're just going to get the most out of it yeah yeah so uh so your, your 40 mil pancake um don't see too many of these about so uh it, it, i'm just wondering how see that, that's the thing when i see about these 40 mil pancakes and i always always immediately think of the the conica 40 mil as well but that's a 1.8 mm -hmm. um so that immediately I mean, you know a lot of people say nice things about the pentax but i always think well the conica is so, 1.8 and this is a 2.8 yeah the yeah. the pentax me um with that lens mike epstein here in hong kong raves about that combo because of how compact it is oh. um but he has pointed out to me that the lens uh, even though he really likes it for its size, he doesn't really like the handling because um, it's the rings are a little small and it's a little bit slow. To I'd operate. agree. Yeah, and I'd agree it's with that. not particularly sharp. So he has just replaced it with the Voigtlander 40 f2 Ultron, uh, mm -hmm. which will now be living on his Pentax ME Super and came out, which looks like a sexy combo. Yeah, I've been th this uh, this 42 uh Pentax pancake. It, it is. It's nice and narrow and it, it's nice and small but I, I would agree in terms of the the grip to actually turn the focus it is quite narrow and you find yourself because you're so used to moving from you know uh turning the aperture wheel and then moving your thumb and your forefinger forward a bit to then focus um and this thing is it's, it's such a narrow space the grip on it is very narrow so you it's just a bit of getting mm. used to um uh, and i'm trying to get my head head around that but as you're talking about that 40 mil F2 Ultron, that's something I've I've sort of been lusting after for my Nikon. Oh, it's um, so nice on Nikon. Yeah, and that's because yeah. I love 40 mil. I, I use the the uh, 40 mil Nocton. It never comes off my CLE, and I think uh -huh. the look the look of that now lens is beautiful. The, the shots I get off that, but there's something about 40 mil. I'm always usually 35 or 50, and 40 is kind of pretty much in the middle. Um, so that's why I got it for the Pentax. As to what the shots will look like, look like, I've got my first roll in it at the moment. I'm putting it through. That should be interesting. But I just, in my, you know, when I put it on in the viewfinder, I, I see a view I'm used to, uh, which I like because it's good enough for portraits and it's good enough for streets. You know, step a bit closer for a portrait, step a tiny bit further back for street. But it, it's a great single lens uh, mm -hmm. that ticks a lot of boxes. But that, um, that scalloped barrel on the uh the 40 mil nocton uh ultron sorry for the nikon i uh, really excites me <laughs> it feels so, it feels so good yeah yeah i'm i'm really tempted by that one uh but this is the other thing i mean i i was gonna buy one and then i thought you know what i'll buy a printer instead because they were the same price <laughs> um and i that's i've been i so i i went and bought a printer recently as well and i because i got to the point where I realize I've been shooting so many things and it, you know, I've made a few books and I love the fact that photography comes to life when you print. And, um, apart from social media where most people stick their photos, I mean, okay, like tomorrow, um, I'm doing a shoot. Um, it's a really stressful shoot. I'm actually doing it. I won't mention the brands, but it's for a sort of big brand and I'm doing a shoot for, uh, baby swimming nappies. So essentially, I've had to hire out a pool. Um, I, then we've got three parents and babies coming along. And we're going to be filming parents and babies in a swimming pool. And because they're babies, the pool has to be at a high temperature. And the external temperature has to be one degree higher than the pool temperature. So we're going to be wor working in about 34 Celsius uh, for about eight hours around a pool with babies uh, and shooting. So that's uh, not going to be fun. But um, where was I going with this? So going back to um, the point of as you, as you start to, you know, you do photography for a while and you amass all these shots. Yes, that was my point. This shoot I'm doing, it's costing thousands of pounds. It's costing this client thousands of pounds to arrange and organize. But um, at the end of the day, the delivery is going to be about 20 single shots that will end up at 640 by 400, 72 DPI. On right. <laughs> you, right. Right. I'm yeah. shooting at 47 megapixels. I've got pro photo flash heads. I've got everything. Right. You know? um, <laughs> and it, it occurred to me that I've got terabytes of photographs that I've enjoyed taking, enjoy looking at, and enjoy sharing. And I thought it was time I finally decided to sort of buy a printer. So I bought, I bought a 
uh, and that was an Epson P600 pigment printer. Um, and I've started to now make and sell prints. But that put me through a really interesting sort of journey in terms of there's always what you think in yourself makes a nice photograph because you shoot all the time. You look through your work and you think, I like that as a photograph. But then when you start to think what makes a good print, it sets up a whole new set of parameters and criteria because what is someone going to buy? And on one level, that can take you down a really cheesy road because a lot of people love landscapey stuff simply because a, a print in a room is essentially a window into another world. And people like that. That's why people love landscapes. Mm. If you've got a, f- a small flat, you put a big landscape picture on the wall, it's like a window and you're looking into a space. So it adds depth to your environment. But you can also easily go down this world of cliché. You know, um, and that kind of street photography that feels a bit like a Banksy print, you know, it's like just ticking Mm -hmm. certain boxes. It's a bit quirky. It's a bit funny. It's a bit edgy. But and so I've now started to print and um, it's uh, (laughs) it's opened up another universe of possibilities, which is all a bit scary because the quality of print is incredible off this machine. The, The cost of the paper isn't cheap. Um, you know, you're oh, sorry, what printer was it again? So it's got? an Epson S Epson P600. So oh, it's okay. a, it's an A3 pigment ink printer. So it's got nine inks in it. Mm-hmm. Four of them are dedicated to black, um, and it's museum quality, archival quality um, prints. And you can print on glossy and matte and whatever the hell you want. Um, so I started to play with that, um, and you know, it's it's been going well. I mean, my my, my plan is to essentially sell enough prints to make the printer pay for itself. Um, I got oh, a quarter of the way through there within 10 days. So that was wow. great. Um, and I'm only just beginning. I've started to have loads of ideas because what I'd love to do is then do print an- another photo book slash uh, zine, that word you don't understand, Perry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, give away a little print inside each one. Um, but my, my whole thing is, you know, we're talking about photography with classic lenses and speaking about the photography bit, um, it is so important to print your work or get it off the screen because you simply engage with it in a totally different way. You can touch it. You can smell it Mm -hmm. if you want. You can get your eye right up to it uh, and really understand the quality that's gone into it. And, you know, uh, the camera I'm shooting with, I mean, I could do A2 prints with it and you wouldn't see a single pixel. And yeah, I'm putting, you know, little images on Instagram for God's sake. Um, So I've started to now re go through. So it was, uh, I spent the two weekends going through literally thousands of photographs thinking, okay, I like this photograph, but does it make a good print? And it's just a really interesting thing you go through because you start to, whether you like it or not, hit on cliches because you think, is the idea to sell prints that, you know, express me in my purest way and my art, or is the idea to actually just sell some prints and get my work out there? And for me, it's sort of in the middle of the two because mm. I, I want to get my work out there. I want to sell prints. I want to be popular. But at the same time, I don't want to do what everyone else is doing. But at the same time, I want to sell shit. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you've got to. I mean, otherwise, what's the point? Um, and there's nothing wrong with having work that's popular, but you start to question what your voice, if you like, as a photographer, what it is you do. And so that that's starting to be an interesting little journey I'm going down. And also just understanding how terrifyingly quick your ink levels go down when you print. Oh, good it. God, yeah. yeah. I mean, you're talking, or when you don't print. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you've got to basically make sure you, you turn this camera on, the, this printer on and off at least once a week just to keep the, the heads alive. Uh, Because if that clogs, you're screwed and you have to go through all sorts of nonsense. But also to swap out one set of inks. And as you know, these printers are are just loss leaders. They're sold at, you know, uh, cost um, just to get them into people's houses because the the money is made off the inks. You're talking £200 for a set of inks. So so what I I do with my um, Canon Pro 10 or whatever printer I have uh, is I have a set of Octo inks that I order from the U.K., um, and I just refill them. Yeah, I don't want to go down the because I know you can go down the whole. You know, by by buying um, non-manufacturer inks, you can reduce your prices massively. 
but then certain colors are off and i'm still getting my head around the whole um icc profile world also the how accurate is my monitor and what you see oh, on that's your so screen annoying. yeah i and to what to, to be honest with you guys to, to a point i've actually just ignored it i'm working off an imac apple imac 27 inch monitor and generally what i see on my screen is what i see on the printer and what i see coming out so i'm not i use the icc profiles i download them for each paper but i've frankly never seen any particular difference so i'm not worrying about it and a lot of my work is monochrome anyway mm. um so it's not relevant um but it is again it's you can geek out to the max you can now get attachments for this printer where you can in it, instead of using original links you can attach these things that then have giant bottles of all these <coughs> colors that just feed in through the pipes and you know you can just um customize them as, as much as you want um but i'll tell you what it's, it's fun it's printing your work is just fantastic and i highly recommend it to everybody i just want to go go back to um when you were saying about choosing which which photographs to print and which ones are going to sell um so, and, you, and you've you you analyzed it um perf- perfectly as far as i'm concerned you know it's a case of uh you know, are you trying to express yourself as an artist or are you just trying to sell prints? And choosing which photographs to print is going to be a really tricky thing. And it's something that I know Mike Gutterman uh, talks about this quite uh, quite often uh, because he does um, art shows and things. Yes. And uh, and he, he has a little bit of a, an artistic struggle uh, with ex- in exactly the same way. You know, he wants to put out the things that he thinks are good, but he knows that they're just not going to go down well. It was, uh, it's the local stuff that sells, uh, generally speaking, anyway. Yeah, I mean, I found where I live, it's very pretty. There's beautiful seascapes and things, and people love all that. And um, there's always that bit. But I think it's, it's a, you, you have to play a longer game with it. You have to get people to love you and your work and then get them to slowly try and buy more or be interested in more of what you are. So I think there's you can't just jump in and go, I'm, I'm this crazy, amazing you know, mm. photographer, and this is my work. People go, well, "Who the f- are you?" And why would I want that on my wall? Some, you know, some people will. And but the way I play it is okay. Um, here are some lovely landscapey type pictures that, again, I like. I'm not putting them up there for sale just to sell them. I'm putting them up because there's, they're ticking two boxes. One is that I like them myself, and I'd have it on my wall. And B, I know other people like it because it's a popular type of image. Um, but then at the same time, I'll also have images of um, things that um, I like that pe- not n- anyone else might like. They're, they're just things that, if you like, are more my voice. But then the other approach I have is I'll say to people, look, you guys have seen my work. If there's anything you've seen of my work that you like, I can print it for you. So I'm sort of trying to tick a lot of boxes and have a bit more of a bespoke approach. So um, one of my customers... Um, picked up on a few of the images that I'd put on my website that were up and for sale as potential prints. But then also he said, you know what, there's this, this picture you took a while back in Brighton that I loved, and I'd love to have a print of that. I said, yeah, I can do that for you. Um, so for me, actually, the, the key is the relationship building with your clients. And, that, and that's right. If, you, if you've got the, the ability to have that relationship, um, that's, that's, that's a key thing. Um, but in, in terms of choo- choosing shots, I'm just thinking about my own experience. I've, I've sold three photographs none of which are actually for sale as such uh one of which was absolutely fell into uh, this is my art and i was delighted that uh, that that it was sold another one sold because it was it was quite a commercial shot and 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 it was of a business and the business approached me and bought it um which was which was nice um and then the third one um that was just something that was up on on facebook and it was it, i don't i'm not even sure if i actually posted it by itself or within within a group and for for me it was just a a nice pleasant shot uh, but to the buyer it was it really spoke to them and there's no way i would have picked that shot to be printed yet that you know one of the few shots i mean and it was a photographer that bought it uh, which i think the, the photographers have got to be one of the hardest people to to try and sell a, a photograph to because they can go out and potentially take a similar photograph assume they've got access to the place if it's landscape but uh, um but yeah i would never have picked that photograph and i just wonder if there's a if there's it would make sense to to run some of these choices past your partner or something like that somebody's less emotionally attached to the photos yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a really difficult one because you ask 10 people, you'll get a lot of the time, you'll get 10 different answers. So I think 
for me, it's about going with your gut. Because uh, you, also, it's, it's a thing you put a lot of effort into. So you want to be printing things you like. That's a good start. Otherwise, it doesn't feel like, you know, otherwise it starts to feel like work. Um, and you don't want it to feel like work. It should feel like a joy. Um, but then at the same time, you know, you have to think about, well, what, what what do most people have in their houses? What do they like? And is there anything I have that is like that? I don't go out specifically to shoot, to pr- shoot stuff to print. I will just look at the stuff I've shot and that I like and then see if it fits into one of those sort of categories and then put it out there. Yeah. Um, so so you're, you're, you're printing your photographs off. Where, where are the public seeing these photographs? So I've done a couple of things. So firstly, I've put to put a a couple of pages up on my website. Um, that's anilmysteryphoto.com if you're interested. But um, what I've done is I went through all my photographs. I found what I felt were the color photographs and the black and white photographs that I liked. So I put them into two sections so people can see them there. But then um, the main thing for me is actually to promote on social media. So I'll put things on Instagram. I, I have a, a page on Facebook for Animal Mystery Photography. So I'll always um, speak to my sort of followers there. And I'll just put stuff out as where, as far and wide as I can on social media uh, whenever I have the time uh, to let people know. So as much as I've got all those images there now and I put out posts saying, look, I'm now selling prints, people are looking at so much stuff, it's important to focus their eye on one thing. So every now and then what I will do is I will choose one image and I'll just push that for a week or two. Um, and at least that will draw people to the website. Uh, to see what else I've got, or they'll like that image. Now, in terms of the whole limited edition thing, at the moment, everything I do is open editions because I I want to sell work. So my prints will be signed. They're on good quality archival paper. Uh, They're packaged in a nice way and sent with care and all that stuff, uh, as you'd expect. Um, And I'm not selling them framed because framing is a world of its own. I could easily go out and buy a, a shitload of IKEA frames but framing is a very personal thing, and I, I'd rather just send the prints out as prints because if you start framing, um, just the um, dealing with all that and the postage and this, that, and the other is a pain in the ass. You end up buying loads of frames for different sizes. Also, a lot of my shots are cropped in different ways, but I try to stick to standard formats, you know, square, A4, A3, uh, 8x5, uh, 7x5, or whatever, uh, so that when it does come to framing, it's quite easy for people to find either frames off the shelf or to get something made that isn't too crazy or difficult yeah it's from what my uh from what i've i've learned it appears if you're actually in a physical environment you're out there in the real world then people tend to gravitate towards the framed pictures so it's it's it, that's an interesting that buying online um it's i mean i can do a lot of advantages for for doing it on the unframed online but it's 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 interesting that that actually goes potentially better um yeah well well, i was the thing that hold that finally pressed that button of buying a printer for me was because i'd been umming and ahhing over it for about two years was i went to the photographer's gallery in soho and there were two amazing exhibitions i think it's still on so one exhibition is about um just the life of soho in london um and the other one is about food but as i was walking around i was reading looking at these prints and firstly it's just great to see prints on a wall and it occurred to me that you know what if i had a printer i can have exhibitions i can exhibit my work i can give it to a local bar or i can put it up in place and actually do my own shows and people can see and touch my work and be get close to it in a way that it gives it elevates it beyond the internet um but um the other thing um was that it made me realize that you can the, the the prints in this in this gallery that were exactly the prints I could actually do on this printer. So one would say G clay print on burrito paper. So G clay is a fancy French word for inkjet. And burrito paper is is a burrito paper is a semi gloss paper which looks like photographic paper. Uh, and then another one would say you know um, inkjet print on matte paper or archival print on whatever. Essentially that they're all the same thing. Um, but you can buy printers that print to that level of quality, you know, from any shop. Um, and for me, it was about pigment inks because they have a longer life and color fastness. 
And for me, it's about using the right paper and everything's acid free and archival so that it lasts. And this stuff in theory has like, you know, 200 year life. But I will tell people when they buy the prints, look, as with any art, don't put anything in direct sunlight. Um, but generally, if you look after it, it will be there for forever, really. So, guys, um, all I can say is make sure you print more of your film and more of your shots because um, it's the best thing you'll ever do in your life. So, moving on from there, <laughs> um, I've got some lenses. Um, touching back on the digital conversation we had and talking about adapting stuff. Um, these are lenses. Uh, I bought them because I've heard the odd good thing about them, but I've also just liked the shape of them and the design, and they're all quirky <laughs> and crazy. So um, I'd love to get your thoughts on uh, which ones are interesting or whether I've just bought a load of crap and wasted my money. Well, um, with, with what you said about both your lenses and the cameras, I'm starting to think that Ed Sheeran wrote that song, Shape of You. For you and your cameras and lenses. I, I'm, I'll tell you, I've never heard a single song by Ed Sheeran in my life, and I never intend to. So, uh, <laughs> All right. Never mind. Our younger listeners will get the reference. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Marvin Gaye kind of guy. Um, right. right. So the first one here um, is the Mir 1 37mm f2.8. Cool. I'm going to mute myself. Yeah. Um, either that's clapping of shame or excitement. Oh, well, well me, it's it's well known to be Carl, Carl Haven's favourite lens. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, uh, Carl, how many uh, – do we keep – Keep tabs on how many I, lenses I, he bought to that one. I think three or four. <laughs> yeah. Why is it? A, is it a uh, known dodgy lens? Uh, well, I can. I think from that we can only surmise that Cole thought it was absolutely amazing uh, because he bought so <laughs> many, um, and, and not because he couldn't get it. He, he hated them so much, but people kept posting nice pictures with him, so he bought another one just in case it's right. bad. And then he bought the next one, and that wasn't any better, or he couldn't do anything else with it, and uh, well. And so on. that behavior sounds similar that's essentially the way i kind of discover new lenses to buy yeah well uh, i'm i'm a fan i i really like the uh the the mere one through seven millimeter f 2.8 and and uh, i've got a picture of it here of yours and it's uh, made in 1973 as well which was a very good vintage so ooh. um so yes uh it's it's a it's a in many in many respect, respects, it's quite a vanilla lens. It's it's got a de- decent sharpness, and it's a thirty seven millimeter lens. Um, but it's the minimum focus distance is a bit weak if you want to get close to things. The and if you you can, and I used to quite often uh, mount it onto a M forty two to M forty two focusing helicoid uh, just to get the minimum focus down. But so you can get some quite interesting effects when you get relatively close with it. Um, but and you, and you need to do that anyway because, like I say, the minimum focus is quite weak on the lens. Uh, but you can you can get some of the bokeh on it if you do wide open and relatively close. It, it can be a little bit uh, busy. I think that's one way of putting it. Um, so it's it's not a, a lens that you might want to do that kind of shooting that often. But you you can get some interesting effects. But why I particularly like about that lens is shooting into the sun. Um, because you can get some pretty wild flare effects, and it's it's a good mm. video lens as well. If you, that's if you like, a, yeah, yeah, that's a very that's good a, point. That's a really good use for it. Yeah. See, that's that's interesting because on recent shoots, what I've uh, I went and bought a prism, and I've also started um, using a glass. Um, so clients are starting to enjoy that sort of look when you introduce aberrations into your shots. Uh, that make things pretty and sparkly. And like in the old video days, what you do is just you just key in a lens flare or add a bit of a, um, you know, a light, a bit of light leak coming in from the side of your shot. But what what we do nowadays, you, you can buy prisms, glass prisms, um, that you essentially hold in front of your lens and just in the corner of the lens, so that you're focusing on your person, the distance, or your shot, but you hold your prism. Um, closer to your lens, just introduce it into the frame, just rotate it until you get either a yeah. beautiful blast of light or color or blurredness that comes in. So people are starting to love that sort of randomness that comes into a shot so everything doesn't look flat and digital. And the other way you do, you do it is you just find use a glass, like a whiskey glass or a, a glass of water glass, and just use the edge of that glass. and let it, yeah, absolutely, and let it just come into your shot and blur and introduce lovely lovely bits and for me i think that's the 
the, the main reason I think I want to start using these lenses is just to add unique character because I've got yeah. enough of that sort of bigger glass, if you like, the pro glass. But for me, that, that, that's what this stuff is about, is the quirkiness that makes something a bit special. Um, okay, so the next, next thing I pulled out. Now, this was I think this was sent to me by, okay, I, I did a, an Emulsive Secret Santa once. Um, and I can't remember what I sent someone, but anyway, the thing I got was a box, and it was frankly, well, yeah, it's one of those things, it's all done the right spirit, so I, I didn't want to complain, but I was essentially sent a box <laughs> with two two Minolta cram- cameras that were totally f***ing destroyed and unusable and riddled with fungus and crap. So I was sent a box of crap, uh, <laughs> but there's one lens I pulled out of it which seemed to be quite clean, and seemed to work, and that was a Minolta MC Rockor PG 50mm 1.4. Um, and I think I've got an X300 somewhere that I might be able to stick this on. But um, I've heard that the word Rockor might be quite good, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and it's a 1.4 and a 50, which I love. Um, so I don't know if you guys have got any thoughts on that, or is it, is it just a standard 70s nifty 50? No, it's a it's a good lens. Uh, that's the, that's that's the first thing. I've I've uh, historically had a bit of a down on anything that says Rocco, um, where some people think that if it says Rocco on it, it's the greatest lens ever. Um, so yeah, it pays money, takes it takes your pick really. But uh, I, I think that's a decent lens. I've uh, I've used a few of them, and uh, yeah, I I like that lens. It's it's. I mean, most most of the fifty one point fours do actually have a have a, a different character to the next one. Even when they're from like the main brands, I think that's one of the one of the areas where a lot of people, when they get into using classic lenses for the first time, they go for the fifty millimeters and they go for the fifty one point fours, and and shoot them wide open, and you can see a difference between them um there are times where really to see that difference you've got to you've got to go looking at probably closer than perhaps you should do um but it's it's still an interesting thing to do just to actually see the differences between lenses but they yeah they they can render quite differently from each other and 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 so on and i'm just talking about 51.4s in in general but no i i think uh um, if if I had received a, a box of rubbish as you describe it there, and it had one of these in there, I think I'd be quite happy with that. Okay, so happy Christmas to me, twenty nineteen. Definitely, yeah, yeah. That, that, that was good. On another note, that mere one, it says on the side, and I'm sure sure Carl would agree uh, that this this uh, elevates it above other lenses. <laughs> it, won, it won the Grand Prix Brussels nineteen fifty eight. That's right. Yeah, yeah. What what is that? A camera Olympics? It's something on those lines, and uh, yeah, they it, it stayed on their lenses for a very long time. I think I'm not sure what year they actually finally stopped putting that on there. And there was another lens that won as well. And I can't remember what it was now. Um, um, the, I think there were there were a couple of lenses that, that won a won, won a prize that year. It was just seems to be a big year, but nobody, I, you never see any. Um, you don't see that award given to absolutely anything else other than this, and I think there's another lens out there for some reason. So, so, so if I put the phrase uh, "winner of the road traffic safety quiz, Medway Junior School, 1979" on all of my <laughs> photograph, photographic prints, do you think I'd uh, I'd sell more prints? It, clearly, it, it, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's just as relevant. Okay, so here's the next one. Hang on, Did, is this the one I mentioned? The Maya Optic Gorlitz Lidith. <laughs> 30 mil 3.5 yeah um, <laughs> a big pause no no i, no, I bought know, a load of junk no not no 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 i don't i don't think i think it's a, it's a decent lens it's uh um it's just for for me at least i, I, I mean clearly it's it's far too cheap for perry to have an opinion on this uh, <laughs> no it, i was gonna say that's the only lens from the ones mentioned so far that i'd be interested in why is that perry i don't know it's cool <laughs> well, I, I think it's. It seems to have what you guys call the the Star Wars bloody grip thing, where it's got. Oh yeah, it looks stupid. Stripey. It's got the yeah, yeah. The the what do you guys call it? No, that's a zebra. Well, zebra. That's yeah. It. It's, it's not Star. Star Wars is different. Star, oh god. Yeah, yeah. There's, it's a, yeah, right. there's, there's the Star Wars Pankalar, 
uh, that okay. uh, is a is a is a cool one. But yeah, the the zebra has got the uh, um, it's it's black and white in parallel lines, whereas the Star Wars one that goes at different angles and it's really groovy. Ah, okay, interesting. Uh, so, what would I use this lens for? Um, apart, things... apart from a paperweight. Yeah, well... I was just going to say paperweight, <laughs> but you beat me to it. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. No, it's, it's fine. It, it's a, it's a, it's a decent lens, and uh, yeah. you use it for anything where you might wish to use a a thirty fill thirty millimeter lens on full frame. That would be a good right, use exactly. for it. It's okay. a really nice focal. It's a really nice focal length. Hmm. Okay, I think what I'm going to start doing because when when I do. Shoots, I normally have the D850 as the main camera, but I've got, I have a D8, D750, so maybe I could put an adapter on that and just have that for some yeah. bit of messing around. Yeah, you're going to have problems, though, because it's, it's going to be, I assume that's M42. Uh, yeah, so it won't go to gonna infinity be a, right. and yeah. all that nonsense. Yeah. No. Ah, the joy. Oh, yeah, it's going to be for you. Paperweight it is, then. Um, then what's this one? You can uh, put, it on to, get, put it onto your Pentax. Get, you, yeah. get an adapter to put it onto your Pentax. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is one that, right, the new one in my hand now is one I've put on my Pentax with an adapter, and I got some really nice shots. And I believe it's in Cyrillic, but if I remember, it's the Indostar 52, mm. 50 millimeter, 3.5. It's tiny. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, another good one for your Pentax. Right. But the, I got some really nice shots with that. And I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that. But I, I love the way it sort of fell off around the edges and stuff and really sharp in the middle. Um, and it could make for an interesting portrait or two. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, as a general rule, I absolutely hate them. Um, as, a general, as a general rule. But as, as I've had to uh, concede a few weeks ago, I, t I took some shots i was particularly pleased with the results of a, it wasn't that particular model but it was a, it was a, a similar a similar kind of thing and it's I, I, I do have a little bit of a soft spot on that especially if you again if you put it onto a helicoid as well the the you can get some good effects close up wide open with that lens it, i really like that lens can i just say i really like that lens um because you know bang for your buck it's super cheap and it performs well but if you get one that's dead, it is also a wonderful uh, way to hold your paper it, down. No, it's it's a really good chassis for adapting other glass um, for mod yeah, for doing that's, modifications. That's, that's very true. And yeah. so, can you just un unscrew the optical block out of it? Is that how that one works? Yeah, you probably can. You can probably just remove the retaining ring and then pop the optics out. Hmm. Um, but this this chassis, this helicoid, and this body are used a lot. Uh, to yeah. convert things like Helios 33 cinema lenses to like LTM or M39 or things like that, or even M42 uh, or Sony. So this lens is just, it's so cheap. It performs well as a 50 because it's a Tessar, right? So it'll be fine. And then if it breaks, you've got like raw ingredients for some epic dicking around. So I think it's, I, I really like these. Oh, well, that if, sounds like me. Epic dicking there are around. Cheap, yeah. If there's cheap broken ones, just send them to me. I'll take okay. all of them. Okay. <laughs> By the way, that 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 phrase, uh, I think that came from Isabel Curdes uh, when mm -hmm. when when she was on. So if you if you've not listened to that podcast, go back because that's an incredible episode talking about dicking around with lenses. I mean, she just goes to extreme. I um I was fascinated by um, her change from well, her Hasselblad kit to Fuji medium yes. format, and that's something that uh, I, I I I'm not a I love my gear and I love it. But at the end of the day, I believe, you know, it doesn't matter what you shoot with the shot is the shot, but I do love having something good with lots of tolerance and space that allows you to pull stuff out. That's why I love resolution. I'm not like a mm -hmm. pixel peeping freak, but you know, I had a D750. It was 24 megapixels. I could crop into it to a point. The D850 is what, 45, 47 megapixels. And it just gives you so, if you're, it gives you a lot more scope in post-production uh, to actually choose a, a point of a shot because a lot of the stuff I do is not necessarily a bit like Isabel, but not to that extreme. I, I'll shoot things knowing there's a part of the uh, part of it that I want, if you see what I mean, as opposed to framing a whole thing. I'll, I'll shoot a situation knowing there's an element of it that I can pull out. And that's the bit I really enjoy is just sitting there in Lightroom, looking at a shot and thinking, what can I make from this? Um, as opposed to necessarily going in and composing a whole frame um, and doing all that stuff. And that's why 
I'm a bit scared that one day I'll just want a middle medium format digital camera, but um, that's for another another day. So, Dude, <laughs> GFX 50R prices are totally. I know, for, I know. Don't what they you are. Get one for about three grand now, and uh, less secondhand. They're they're like two thousand pounds here in Hong Kong. I'll, man. I'll tell you what worries me, Perry, is why are people putting them on the market in the first place? And that worries me because they're, if they're that good, people wouldn't be just chucking them away. Uh, you no, know, most people. It, I, it, it, sorry, go on, Johnny. I was get, I was going to say you have to consider the user base of a camera exactly. like that. The, those those are people who have that much money to just screw around with, and they use yeah. it for a little while, and something better come new newer comes out, and they just dump yeah. that and get another. I mean, it's the same thing with like used uh, Leica digital is the yeah. same way. People will just they'll they'll have a perfectly good M10 that they've shot, you know, a few thousand frames on, and then the newest thing comes out and they'll dump that and get the new one. Exactly. So, so it's probably, it's probably very light. <laughs> it would probably be very lightly used. And then, you know, a great, a great find. Mm. Uh, having, having just recently gassed somebody um, into buying one of these. <laughs> um, <laughs> Shame on you. The people who are selling them, um, they're often in like mint condition. Cause Johnny's right. right. The people who are selling them either have bought that, plus a 50s plus a 100 and, right. are, and decided they just they like the 50s better and can deal with the size or they upgraded to a gfx 100 or uh yeah they're just bored of it now and they're selling it and getting like an m10 monochrome right 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 or they're wow. using it to you know finance like a hugo meyer lens or something you know so they're actually they're being dumped because of the exactly what johnny said the the user base so i would actually be much more confident in buying a secondhand gfx than like a secondhand um entry level fuji which is probably yeah. just sitting in someone's <laughs> yeah. tourist bag being chucked it's around wrecked. the world right yeah well that that's scary now you've got me onto another trip there um okay so <laughs> Moving on to another lens. Uh, I'm waiting for some sniggers here because this, I don't know what this is. A Helios Auto Wide Angle F2.8 35mm. Mm. <laughs> what the? Hey, what is it? Piece of shit. Uh, <laughs> well, Standard. We, well, this, this, this is the lens that uh, famously uh, Graham Jago's got as well. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, and the, oh, you, you've, I've reduced myself down to his level. And you, you, you slagged it off. Yes. Um, well, I sort I sort of did, and it may be a perfectly fine lens, uh, but it's 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 not what people well, it's not what some people think it is, uh, because it, right. you, you see the word Helios, <laughs> and you you immediately think Russian or Soviet, and this isn't. Uh, this is a a Japanese uh, lens that's uh, the the name is was licensed out at, at some point in some period, but it, I think. I, I think they, I'm not sure if you can actually get new Helios lenses now or not, but either way, um, this this goes back to the dark days, and I mean you could argue, you know, since when is uh, the dark when days have, of shit cameras? Yeah, but when when it's almost like uh, when have when have Soviet lenses been the been the peak of uh, lens manufacture? Um, <laughs> you know, so yeah, this, this is it's it's why we like Russian lenses, and you've got a load of Russian and East German lenses there in in this list, yeah. and. Uh, and it's because they, they, there's just something about them. In many cases, there's variability, and some of them are just a bit odd, and some of them don't work as well as they should do, or they do something a little bit strange. Um, and even when they and when they're working right, this, they can still be a little bit odd. But that that attracts us to them. Uh, yeah. where, whereas with this Helios, it's a Japanese OEM lens that is a perfectly decent lens, and it's also perfectly forgettable at the same time. Well, now you've spurred me on to do some incredible stuff with it. Good. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a, I've always been a fan of the underdog. And uh, yeah, okay, so that's interesting. So now you're bringing me to the a thing I saw in a charity shop the other day, which just blew me away because it just looked like a, well, just a, a giant phallic symbol, frankly. But it, it's really interesting. It's a, a Rubinar 500 millimeter F8, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> and it's got a mirror in it and it just makes me think of every spy movie i saw in the 70s um and i i did actually put it on my uh d850 to take some pictures of some flowers in my garden it was quite interesting i'm pretty sure you can adapt that to a hasselblad and it'll cover six by six it's uh it's a it's a bit of a monster <laughs> yeah you're gonna get wow. uh typical mirror lens bokeh with that you know what yeah, does that weird. mean Donuts. So you like donuts? 
If you yeah, like donuts, bit, you'll you'll love it. But yeah. really thin donuts, you know, not the nice juicy bagel kind. Okay, so you're saying <laughs> it's you're, you're saying it's crap, basically. No, 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 no. No, it, is going to have a big hole in the middle, basically. Okay, I see. Of course, because of the uh, thing there, right? Yeah, because of the big thing in the middle. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I'm they, gonna... They're in a the quiet taste, and um, the Ru- Rubinars. The I mean, the with the Soviets. We're talking about another Soviet Soviet lens. Uh, there were, to my knowledge, there were two manufacturers of of those. Um, so you've got the Rubinars or brands, I should say. Uh, you've got the Rubinars, and you also got the MTOs. And I believe the consensus is that the Rubinar lenses are better than the MTOs. Um, I don't know how true that is, but either way, what you're going to get with 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 that lens is low contrast. Um, that's just how it is. I don't think you get chromatic aberration with mirror lenses uh i think that's the case but i don't know if you're really that bothered about that but low contrast is going to be something that uh, you'll you'll notice um certainly i I was always boosting contrast uh with those but i think it's just a, a characteristic of the lens um and the other part is they're just really really difficult to actually use um, because usually the the barrel is is pretty big. I mean, to be fair, the five hundred isn't too bad. I mean, I've used I've used an MTO that was up to uh, it was eleven hundred millimeters, and it was huge. You could hardly span your hand around it. So you needed almost like two hands to focus a thing. You know, so uh, um, so yeah, they they they're not particularly easy to use. They they're better off when you on a on a tripod. You can do things that are moving, but they just it's just difficult. Um, so, uh, for, for me, they're, they're novelty lenses. You do them because you, you want to have a go at them and then you, you tire, tire of them very quickly and then they disappear and you get them sold. Well, I'm all about the novelty. Yeah. So the final one here, um, is it's, I was in, um, where was I? Hastings, um, I'm walking around, no, was it Hastings or Eastbourne? I was in, it was... Eastbourne, I think, um, and there was a camera shop there. I went in, and they had an amazing display of o- old cameras and lenses. But um, my eye, I caught my eye on this uh, Carl Zeiss Sonar One Three Five Two Point Eight, uh, which is a contact mount, contact Yashica mount, uh, which I ended up buying. And it was really sweet because the guy, I asked for a discount. I actually got twenty five percent off the lens. He, he said to me held my hand and said, you are going to use it, aren't you? I was like, yeah, I'll use it. <laughs> um, so he let me have it at, um, 25% off. But it's, it's a lovely, heavy piece of glass, and it's on my Contax RTS2 at the moment. I tried it out last year on a photo walk in Brighton, but I still haven't developed the shots. But um, it th- looks like a good lens anyway. I don't know what you guys think. You're the experts. Yep. Good lens. You got the AEJ version. Uh, try stopping it down a little for some Ninja Star bokeh. It's good. Okay. Other other things about it. Um, you say it's heavy, uh, but I, last time I had one of those, I also had in my possession uh, the Leica equivalent of it as well for Leica R. And if you if you think the Zeiss one's heavy, you you pick up the the, the lights one, the, the Leica one, and you think, what have they done with this? Why why yeah. is this so heavy compared to an already heavy lens? And it's as if like, well, uh, Carl Zeiss but, have made it this heavy, so we need to make it heavier. That's exactly why it's heavier. Counterbalance. <laughs> yeah. No, it's exactly why it's heavier. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's that on is the, the reason. <laughs> it's on the RTS two, which is quite a heavy camera, so uh, yeah. that kind of works. Yeah, it's a it's a be- it's a beautiful handling lens. I, I love the way how the, the the focus ring is massive. It looks like a zoom lens, like a push pull zoom lens, uh, but it's not. You know, it's obviously a prime. Um, the other the other interesting thing about that lens, especially if you compare it to the uh, the East German uh, Carl Zeiss Jena. Uh, 135 3.5 is that the the contacts lens um it, it's more, far more prone to flare than the east german lens uh which i think I've, I've got that i think i've got that uh cult uh the yena one uh it's got is that the one with like 15 thingies in it no that that will be the um my pentacon optic. Pentacle, my rock, yeah. the Gorlitz. Yeah, that's yeah, I've got that. That's a yeah, cracking that's lens in itself. Full um, of fungus, it's really annoying. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, but the 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 East German ver- effectively the East German version of that lens was slightly slower. Um, 
is is pretty much as good actually as the uh, as the Japanese and Germ- German one for contact action shikari in, in, in my opinion in, in many respects except for handling because it's horrible I really don't like the East German lens at all um, but uh, but yeah uh, I, I, in the end I didn't keep uh, even though I wanted one for years I didn't keep mine um, because they had other 135 millimeter lenses which were frankly the equal to it or better. Um, so it was just I looked at it and thinking this is this is too expensive for seeing that I have other lenses that you know for a fraction of the price which are equally as good. So uh, so that we went. I mean it's it's I I also have a the Nikkor uh, one three five two point eight hmm. AIS which is a lovely lens but I've never quite found a use for it. I mean the the times I've used it is when I do st- I I like street photography that's quite close. But some, I, I went out and did a project. I thought, okay, I'm going to go full zoom and um, create these really compressed shots with loads of perspective in them uh, and get very graphic looking um, environments. And that's the only place I've I've sort of used that lens. Um, mm. Whereas 135, you know, I'd go to, I've got the 105 2.5 AIS, which is great for portraits, but 135 is almost a bit too far. You get to that point where unless I'm on tripods and on legs, and I hate being on a tripod you could get into wobble, you know, and it just makes it that bit more difficult to use. So I think it's a spying, a nosy spying lens, as far as I'm concerned. Well, well, Johnny Johnny introduced us to the exact meaning for that lens, and I've been using it in exactly that, that way, um, although not quite in the way that Johnny described it, because I think Johnny... Uh, said that you should be wearing lederhosen and, and uh, walking up mountains um, mm-hmm. because it's a landscape lens uh, and picking out details in landscape that's that's my take on the 135 okay interesting but i don't do yeah. do landscape so uh, i think i'll just i'll just try and spy on people i think that could be <laughs> my thing um so the other thing i have is um so i was contacted a couple of weeks ago by um Lomography, and they asked me if I was interested in looking at um, and playing with some lenses that they've made. So it's a, it's called their Neptune series, Neptune Art series. Now, I suppose it's a it's a manual lens, so I don't know if it's a classic lens, but it's a manual lens. But, it, but basically, the way th- this whole system is essentially three lenses that come with a, an adapter. Um, so they're all fixed focus. Let's have a look. Hang on. Let's just pull these things out. It was sent in a box marked Tesco Color Bio Detergent Tablet. So it was sent in a dishwasher <laughs> box, but it was well wrapped. <laughs> so I'm just taking them out here. But essentially, you have three lenses. Uh, you've got Thalassa, which reminds me of Panthalassa by Miles Davis. Uh, so that is a 35mm 3.5. Then you have Neptune or, or Proteus of Neptune. Oh, no, hang on. Oh, Thalassa of Neptune. Oh, there must be some mythological connection here with all these. Then you've got Proteus of Neptune, which is a... Christ, what is that? 80 mil F4. And then you've got Despina of Neptune. Oh, they, well, were they the daughters of Neptune? Mm. <laughs> Possibly. <Maybe. laughs> I'm going to look this up in a minute whilst you guys talk about it. Despina of Neptune, which is a... 50 mil f 2.8 so they're essentially lenses that come on a mount but then they've got this interesting thing where you can slot in these different bokeh oh they are in a little film canister i thought that might have been a bit of uh weed they put in there for me but no it's just oh uh, bummer the film canister i know so <laughs> essentially they've got these little shapes here i've got a star i've got a cross i've got it, a it teardrop is- I just, I just looked, I just looked this up, and it, it, these, it looks amazingly like um, the lenses for. I know uh, what you're gonna say. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, for for like the uh, what you call it, the bullseye. Um, well, for any of the those old interchangeable lens uh, Zeiss 35 millimeter cameras. I was gonna say, Whoa, the, that's, no, that's the, not what I thought you were gonna say. Yeah, the bullseye uh, is co- is as is. Uh, yeah, that's right. The one about the other yeah. ones where you've. Um, it's it's got a, a fixed lens in the ca- in the camera and then right. These, uh-huh. these I thought you were going to try to say retina. Yeah. Well, or right. that as same well. same base yeah. same same basic concept. Yeah. So we all yeah. we, we so the, the, the Perry and I knew exactly what you were going to say and and you said neither. Yeah. <laughs> and then we, were, we, we had different ideas. So. Uh, well, yeah, but when you, I'm just going to say, you mentioned earlier about them being fixed focus. That's not quite the case, is it? Isn't the focus actually in the mount? Yes. Oh, no, yes. Hang on. So I, mean, I meant yeah. a fixed um, focal length. Um, 
then it zooms uh, fixed well. prime prime they look, they look um, like fun to play with yeah so there's focus in the mount and then there's a, a stepless sort of aperture ring as well is is there a glass element in the mount or is all the optics in the yeah uh, there's there's a, no. there is a there is a glass element in the yeah. mount uh yeah. so it's like the redna style yeah. right stuff the older so, dkl yeah. ones i'm assuming that gives you close focus and infinity focus or whatever Used to uh, use a technical term. No, I, I, think no. I think it's more, yeah. they're all, almost like working like teleconverters, or there's a pass a teleconverter yeah. in one part and then the other bits click click into it. Right. It's, it's a, yeah. it's a you, know, you can't just use the front the front part of it. Um, right. it, it needs no. to be paired up with the bit at the back. Yeah. Uh, but it keeps the, it keeps the weight down in the other the other in the interchangeable parts of the lenses i think that's that's yeah. the advantage of it but um i think the the disadvantage would be that um usually when you when you've got a lens that requires another lens to work then it's a bit like using a teleconverter isn't it but I think people. I think the the optimal way to have a lens design is that everything works in harmony with with each other piece. Whereas this is designed that you've got you've got a starting point and you have to make the other bits work with the bit that sits next to the camera. And that is that always a good idea when you've got well, wide angles and and uh, longer. No, lines? I mean, it, it, it. Perry, go. Like, no, yeah. go ahead. No, no, I was, I was going to say, I mean, it, it, it totally works. I mean, this was that that's why I mentioned the bullseye. I mean, it was, it was like the, the pro system, but, but the bullseye yeah. doesn't have an extra glass element. That's right. Yeah, reason... No, but it has the glass that sits inside the, it has the, in, in the body. No, bit no, too. no, 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 the contracts bullseye doesn't. No. Okay. <laughs> you can totally adapt those lenses to other stuff and they're gorgeous and phenomenal contaflex um, i think you're talking about contaflex. The contaflex. yeah not i'm the, talking about the contaflex yeah, yeah. We, the, oh sorry a, i thought you were talking about the contarex no yeah, yeah. They, exactly well, the bullseye is a is a contarex is that yeah, correct yeah, yeah. and yeah. what john is talking about is contaflex amazing. gotcha because on the retina it, the retina system it makes sense because they are fitting a shutter in between the rear glass elements and the front ones um so here, I think it's just a design choice, right, to save them space and manufacturing complexity. A novelty factor it's, as well. It's it's perfectly it's a perfectly acceptable and mm. fine yeah. way to do it. I mean, I, it, it, I mean, really, it is. It is, and yeah. it, it 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 makes sense why they're why they're doing it, and it. I'm sure these things would be fun to play with. Yeah, because um, you you have the aperture add-ons, right? So the space yeah. in between. Yeah, it yeah, totally yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Uh, it's a, it, it does look and feel like a very lomography product, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Got that that something quirky, something different to play with that might give you interesting results. Scary thing, I've just opened the box and there was a there's a little almost a contract in there. All goods not returned to Lomography UK within two months and without prior arrangement will always be invoiced to the borrower at the full recommended retail price. No. Looks, like, looks like I've got eight weeks to try this thing out if I've got the time before they're gonna make me buy it. Um, so I, it's on higher purchase, basically. <laughs> I, I had no idea. <laughs> I better get shooting with this thing. Um, but yeah, that should be interesting. Another thing too. But at least it's all left mount, so I can just sort of just get it on the camera and play with it and see what yeah. see what I can do with this thing. Um, it should be interesting. I love I love a quirky toy. I think what I might do with this stuff is try some portraits and see what I can get with it. But um, we shall see. Time is the enemy, right? time is a thing <laughs> it's like i the, the thing i've found more and more is that I, i've got kit to play with i've got cameras and i've got the intent but that it's just hard to find the time to get out and do things that's why i love doing photo walks because it focuses everybody gets everyone together and everyone encourages everyone to you know photo take pictures um which is such a nice thing yeah yeah no, ex exactly no, I, I agree um, yeah Right, I th I think we we need to start bringing things uh, to a, to a close now, um, but uh, we do have some emails, uh, but I th we we haven't really got it enough time to do to do the majority of them justice. Um, so, but there is one email that we must do because uh, it's from Bob Matter, um, and uh, and as Anil said earlier when I said about this, uh, that matters. 
Uh, so, um, <laughs> um, so, um, and not only that, Bob actually is not only written to uh, the Classic Lenses podcast, he's also written the same email into the uh, Large Format Photography podcast as well. So he really wants to get this, the, the word out uh, about this. So, uh, Johnny, do you want to uh, read out Bob's, Bob's email? Uh, yeah, as soon as I find it. Is this the John Beasley? It is. Okay. So let me open this up. Let's see what Bob has to say. Bob says, um, Simon, please make this announcement on the CLP and LFPP uh, and exhibit a large format salt prints and wax salt prints from the 1850s by photographer and Egyptologist John Beasley Green is on display at the Art Institute of Chicago now through May 25th, 2020. Additionally, admission to AIC is free for Illinois residents on weekdays now through March 4th. And there is a link. Uh, and Bob says, I encourage visitors to also view the continuously rotating exhibit of photographs from the museum's permanent collection located in the lower level. Be like Carl, Bob Matter, Chicago. Yeah, that looks like a good one. I'm glad, I'm glad he mentioned this. I'm going to go check that out. I haven't been over there in ages because it's too expensive for me to go anymore. Uh, but it is, in fact, free right now. Uh, so this is a great time to go. It certainly is. And uh, actually, um, let's do one one other email, which is very, very similar to this. Uh, and it's the one from James Thorpe uh, regarding Joseph Sterling. James Thorpe. Okay, one moment. Let me go back to Joseph Sterling. Okay. Um, James Thorpe says, this one's mainly for Johnny. Uh, if I was in Chicago, I'd definitely check out this gallery exhibit. And this gallery exhibit is, I'm just clicking through the link and I'm going to tell you all about it. Monovisions.com is the website it is slowly taking me to. Um <laughs> You still don't okay, wind, wind, up, wind up internet there. <laughs> yeah. Black and white phot photography magazine. Uh, early and unknown photographs from the archive of Joseph Sterling. So, and then I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read you like the first paragraph here. Um, born in Texas in 1936, Joseph Sterling was an avid photographer as a teenager. After seeing an image by Harry Callahan, he made his way to Chicago to study with him at the now famed Institute of, hold on, pop up window coming up into the screen here, a now famed Institute of Design ID. There he developed his vision and completed a master's degree culminating in his thesis project in which he embedded himself with a group of mid-century American teenagers at the peak of rock and roll, aptly titled The Adolescent Comedy. The project consists of hundreds of some of the angstiest, heartwarming, and timeless images on the subject. Uh, so I will put a link... This link as well. Uh, one moment. Okay. So yes, I will. I will share this link as well. Um, Does it just just I'll, I'll scroll down that link uh, that, that's in there? And the, and the have you seen the photograph at the bottom? Um, uh, there, there's a, there's, there's a, it's a street. It's a street photograph taken at night, and uh, it, it the, the, there's a there's a gentleman looking in in one direction, uh, more or less in the same direction as the sign that's behind him, uh, which is saying "Try your free chest chest X-ray." <laughs> but he's got such a cool outfit on. Yeah. Oh, a really loose in his relaxed baggy suit. But for me, oh yeah. There's a shot, two shots up with the two boys, and there's the. Uh, on the river it's got a real huckleberry finn vibe yes. but what, what, what's interesting oh, about all these yeah. is that they're, they're from a time way back but they they're, there's they're quite modern you know yeah. it's there's deliberately captured people with blurs and um lots of blurred stuff it, it, that's beautiful yeah yeah yeah, yeah. That, no that's great um yeah that 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 era of photography is really interesting and the institute of design um I mean, some of, well, I mean, both of my photo mentor people, <laughs> um, Barbara Crane and Ken Josephson, both studied there in that era uh, with Harry Callahan um, and also teaching there at the same time um, is, uh, oh my God, I'm spacing on his name, uh, Art Sinsabaugh. So like basically all of my favorite and most influential photographers all came out of the Institute of Design uh, in that era, either studied there, taught there or whatever. So yeah, that's, that's some really interesting work. Um, that's definitely a good one. So I'm going to check both of those out. So thank you, 
uh, personally, I want to say thank you to both of you for those recommendations. That's great. It, it seems like Chicago is the place to be for exhibitions at the moment. Yeah, I guess so. Um, there's always a lot going on here photographically. So um, we've got the Museum of Contemporary Photography. And um, yeah, there's a, there's always a lot going on uh, in the photo world. So here in Chicago, I must say. Excellent. Okay, well, uh, one more thing that I need to do, and that's to say thank you to those people who have donated to the show since last time. And uh, I'll just bring uh, things up. Where are we? Oh, today, 17th. So um, we've had a couple of donations. So uh, thank you very much for those two. Uh, one from Nigel Cliff uh, saying, another, another great shoe, guys. Uh, I think that means show. I think I think it must be shoe gaze. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I think I think uh, Nigel's been <laughs> typing on his phone there with uh, um, with um, autocorrect, not quite helping him out too well. Um, yeah, shoe gaze. Yeah, um, and uh, I'm, I'm one of the saddos who who mentally converts the focal length uh, when they go from Fu Fuji to uh, and Olympus. I think we all do, um, especially those of us that you shoot different. Uh, crop sensors and things uh, i think it's just a natural thing to do to make sense of the world um and then uh, jared temp tremper has also uh, donated to us and he says here glad my wife and i can bring sunshine to johnny's day at central camera uh, <laughs> I, I suppose i need to head down more often until then have a cup of have a cup of coffee uh, a Thanks. cup of coffee will suffice very much Okay, um, so thank thank you, Nigel. Thank you, Jared, um, and uh, um, Anil. Um, thank you for being with us again. It's been great to have you with us. Oh, it's been a big pleasure, guys. It's been yeah, uh, really nice to be on the show. It's been a while, hasn't it? It has. Yeah. It has. And yeah. uh, so um, you've you've mentioned a, a, a couple of ways of of the well, the people of obviously buying things off you and such. But uh, perhaps you want to give us a, a rundown of the places where you can be found online okay uh so on facebook there's an uh i have a site a page anil mystery photography um on twitter i'm at anil mystery that's a-n-i-l-m-i-s-t-r-y and then my website is anil mystery photo.com and on instagram i'm at anil mystery photo Excellent. And uh, have you got any shout outs? Um, uh, no, I would say my shout outs are to you guys. Uh, you do an amazing job. And, you know, I my day job is I commute in and out of London most days. And uh, that's two hours there, two hours back minimum. And whenever there's a new episode of your show available, uh, it just makes my day because it's something great to listen to on the way in and on the way out. So uh, bless you and keep it going, fellas. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank thank yeah. you. Thank you. Cheers. Um, so that that means we should we'll continue to make two hour shows. Uh, yes, please. Uh, <laughs> minimum. Minimum. This this seems to be the consensus among uh, uh, commuter listeners. <laughs> no, but uh, I think the point is it, it's what I've realised. I listen I listen to a lot of photography podcasts, and if they're too tightly formatted, it feels too much like a, just a little moment. And when people talk on, you guys probably think you're rambling, but when you're what you think is rambling you're actually just talking naturally and enjoying what you're talking about and that makes for a more interesting conversation for everybody else because you guys aren't concerned about the time and we all enjoy it so please keep it up yeah. right. excellent um well thank you very much um yeah so uh perry have you got a shout out this week uh i don't think so okay johnny i do i have i have three shout outs um uh, the first is from uh, Hong Jun Lee, who uh, I must say, uh, in the cast of characters that I see regularly at Central Camera, he is one of the most omnipresent. <laughs> so Hong Jun Lee and uh, and Bob Matter uh, and Robbie J when he's in town <laughs> are th are three of uh, the most frequent visitors. But Hong Jun Lee, he'll he'll usually come in first thing in the morning to pick up his processing his photo processing and then he'll drop by later in the day to drop off more processing and then he comes in like another time randomly during the day just for i just i don't know why um so i, I typically see him about three times a day <laughs> 
<laughs> so it's and it's always good to see you. Uh, and and um, he's he's always got uh, something going on to chit chat about. Uh, and what he, he the other day he brought me, uh, we were talking about food, and so we were talking about food uh, during his morning visit, and then in his afternoon visit, he brought me a couple of printed out from the internet great reads uh, that are food recommendations that I will share with you all in the in the notes. But he he wanted me to mention these uh, to you in particular, Perry, um, and the one is. This uh, place called uh, Great Sea Restaurant, which is a Chinese-Korean uh, place in Albany Park that is known for its lollipop-style chicken wings. Ooh. Yeah, and he, and, and he thought in particular, Perry, that you would be a big fan of these. Wait, is he making me – he's making restaurants, restaurant recommendations in Chicago for me. Yes, but I think the idea I think the idea was that you would probably be familiar with this particular delicacy. You know, you know, Perry, that, that really famous Asia, ancient Asian recipe, lollipop chicken wings, that's yeah. been around for three thousand well, years. Well it, it it sounds like it's sort of a um uh a hybrid fusion Asian Oh I know what they are. They're yeah. really damn yummy. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So he he thought you would appreciate those. Yeah. And he, he and then he brought me another mm. another link. Um, and this one is about, uh, oh, what is this stuff called? It's, um, well, it's about Korea's black day. And it says the, the, the article title is Korea's black day. When sad single people get together and eat black food. <laughs> and there, there's a bowl of, uh, Jang Jang Myeon noodles. I'm <laughs> sure I have not pronounced that right. I'm sure I have not pronounced that right. Oh my God, um, that's hilarious. Yeah, but it's uh, let's see, is it chocolate something with chocolate and noodles? And I'm not sure. No, it's not chocolate. It's it must be like a bean paste, right? Yeah, it just uh, I'm looking. I, at... I, I think I've had this, and it's pretty yummy. It's like Korean goth cuisine, <laughs> essentially. Korean goth I, I, cuisine, I, yes. Yeah, I don't think it's emo eats. Uh, the Chinese style noodle dish is one of South Korea's national foods. It says here, um, right? Yeah, it's like yeah. a black bean, or like not not necessarily black bean, but like a bean paste. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had that. It's, it's delicious. Yeah, it's yeah, right, right. It is a bean paste. Yeah, exactly. So he, so both of these, you, Perry, you you kind of came up in reference to both of these food wise. So I will I will share these two links um, in the program notes. And uh, thank you very much for those. Sweet. Um, yeah, and Hong Jun, he's he um he is a big fan of Canopy, and he is a big fan of the Nick R H fifty F two LTM, which I hooked him up with one of those that we had at Central Camera, and I he just he adores that lens, um, as do I. So does he? Glad. Does he listen to the podcast? Oh yeah, he is a big podcast okay. listener. So assuming that he's listening, um, I do love Korean food. So if I ever do end up coming to Chicago, uh, which I may be able to do because flights are pretty empty right now um and therefore super cheap because you know coronavirus and protests and stuff uh, <laughs> right Han- hanjun come back to johnny and give him your recommendations uh for the best gamja tongue and spicy duck bogey uh and maybe like a korean fried chicken and then we'll come to that because he seems to have good taste. I gotta say, buffalo oh, wings he, are oh, yeah. my weak weakness. They're like my kryptonite. You put I, buffalo just, wings in front of me, and I just yeah. I do whatever you want. I just gotta say, Perry. He he asked me also in the course of this conversation if you were ever going to come to Chicago. So I have a feeling if you do show up here, we would have an epic visit um, of eating all over town. So. So I highly recommend you get your ass here, and we'll set up a huge eating photo. Uh, journey across chicago <laughs> all right i i might be able to do that because i basically am out of uh out well, of you need toilet like, paper so you, you no, no, like <laughs> I, I got toilet paper now Two people oh you do me out yeah, okay. yeah we got, i got toilet paper now but i'm basically not i, I can't i can't work until like mid-march because i was gonna say you did, did they down. just close the schools down for another month right 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 so i might as well like take advantage of cheap air tickets um yeah. and fly staff standby over to uh Chicago because I think it'll cost me like a hundred bucks to get over them. Oh, you, 
you should you should yeah. do it especially as it gets a little bit closer to March because the weather won't be as crappy and the we might have some sunlight by then. Do you have ice and fishing? Ice fishing? Yeah. Well, there's not really any ice, so or just fishing. You could just do fishing. I could take you to that spot. I posted that photo of the guy who caught the huge uh, lake trout. Oh yeah, okay, I'm I, there. Yeah, I could take you there, and also you could maybe time your visit. Uh, for the start of smelt season, and we could go out, Ooh. and I could take you out along the uh, the lakefront, and we could go chat with all the smelt fishermen, and you could probably drink malort and do some smelt fishing. So, uh, oh, God this it. is turning into an epic visit, Perry. You're really so. trying to get malort down our throats, but yeah, yeah, okay, <laughs> Perry. Right. Perry, yeah. if you ever come to uh, the UK, I live I live by the sea, and I have a, a kayak, and you're welcome to take it out and p- pull some mackerel out of the sea. There's loads of mackerel Sweet. where I live. Sweet. I do like going to the UK. Um, yeah, for a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> welcome yeah. to our joke. Yeah. And don't, and, <laughs> we live in it. And don't don't forget to come to Stoke on Trent, where you can have bacon and cheese oat cakes. In beautiful pottery. <laughs> well, if Stoke were still in the Premier League, that would be a, a draw. Oh. But uh, oh, you know, we don't count anymore now, do we? <laughs> oh, I go to Brighton. Though. We can watch Brighton Hove Albion. Yeah. All right. All right. My son works there. He'll probably serve you a drink Sweet. and maybe sneak you a free pie. <laughs> well, look at all these! Look at all these awesome travel opportunities. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, traveling food. You can't traveling go wrong. Food. That's it. You might as well just do a world tour, Perry. <laughs> all right. All right, back to the shout outs. So, I, <laughs> <laughs> you see what you did, Hong Jun Lee? You got us all off on the food here. So, okay. Um, uh, well, I'd also say a quick shout out to uh, Ron Whiteman, who I saw very briefly on Saturday. He just sort of breezed in um, and said, you know, he just wanted to say hello because uh, he was in town with his wife. I think they were in for the symphony, um, if Ron from uh, Minnesota. So, that was really super cool to see, Ron. And actually, uh, interestingly enough, we talked about the Fuji uh, XF10 and the what is it, the X70. We had a little chat about those because he's a Ooh. yeah, he's a big fan of the uh, 70 as a pocket yeah. camera. Oh, yeah, I'm crying inside right now. I'm crying. Yeah, so we had a whole chat about that. Um, but the the no flip screen was a deal breaker for him oh, on the Jesus XF10. Christ. So make of that what you will. Uh, and then uh, I also on Saturday I had a chat with uh, uh, Patrick Venari, who was in town with his uh, his wife and I believe his daughter, and they were in town. And he's a longtime listener and wanted to say hello and had very fine things to say about both of you other two gentlemen on this podcast. So, thank you, Patrick, for stopping in and saying hello. That was super cool. Sweet. Yeah, and hopefully, I haven't missed anyone else. If I if I have, uh, good to see you all as well. Excellent, awesome, so that's great, a shout great, out. great shout outs there. And, uh, <laughs> uh, what can what can we say? Um, I don't think I've got too many shout outs this week. In fact, I don't think I've got any. Um, so I'll just say, come and see me at the Six Towns Dark Room in Stoke on Trent on the Tuesday night. Um, and uh, but that's getting even. It's going to get to the point where it's actually quite popular, um, which is which is pretty cool, really, for something that wasn't nothing was really happening there a year ago. And now we have, I think, I think we've got eight members. I think there might be a couple more people that are thinking of coming down. So uh, yeah, if you fancy having a go at uh, proper printing, uh, not the kind that Arnold does. In a in a dark room, um, then. Uh, which 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 really is the best kind of printing I've got to say. Not that I can actually make a print that I'm particularly happy with, uh, but that's 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 all part of the fun, isn't it? Really. Um, so uh, so that's on a, a, ch- a Tuesday night, and uh, that's that's pretty much it for for me. So um, seeing it was it was ages ago since I last uh, spoke to Anil. Thank you again, Anil, uh, for being you're, with us. <laughs> you're very welcome. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and and that's it. Um, uh, things to mention, uh, our music is by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com and it's called Octo Blues. Um, you can, oh, I've just realized we still you need totally to go back. totally forgot to, the outro. Yeah, there's, uh, well, the thing is, John, Johnny, no, no, I didn't forget it this time. Because I shouldn't be doing the outro yet because Johnny hasn't finished things. And that's, uh, so Johnny, 
Um, how how can people keep in touch with us and do stuff and contact us on the show and things like that? Okay, so you should send us an email at classiclensespodcast at gmail dot com, which we have proven yet again we actually read them, proven it again today. So uh, send us an email there. Um, also, of course, follow the podcast at classiclensespodcast dot com, where you can get the full show notes, of which there will be many for today's episode. So. Um, uh, I've actually been taking notes today as I mean to do every week, but I've actually done it today and I have links for every, almost, well, not everything, but all, many of the things that we talked about today. Uh, so you can do that at classic lenses, podcast.com. If you are on Instagram, please check out, uh, best vintage lens on Instagram and they have great photos, uh, every single day, uh, that are made with classic lenses. And of course, also there you will find, uh, Ricardo Bayon's um, weekly, almost weekly uh, review of the sh- review slash uh, notes from notes of the show of each podcast, which are of course better than the podcast itself. So you want to make sure you check that out while you're there. Um, what am I missing, Simon? What did I, th- I miss? I, th- I think we did. I miss something. Where, where are we on Facebook and things like that? I don't think so. No. Maybe. Okay. All right. Well, there's that then. Okay. Um, well, that's it then. So I'll I'll stop. Oh some- wait, I did forget <sighs> something. Uh, y- YouTube. You need to. You need you. If you want to look at something on a monitor and listen to the podcast at the same time, um, you can do that on YouTube. So go to look for Classic Lenses Podcast on YouTube. There yes. We go. And uh, this week in particular, every time you hear Simon say something, you should pause the podcast and then pull up a, a Nelly song and listen to that and then go back to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think I'm going to have to add a, an outtake in now just so it, people it was, can understand that. It was really that interesting. In it's really interesting to discover that Simon has been to every Nelly concert in the UK <laughs> ever. Such a massive fan. Simon, you've amazed me. <laughs> I'm full of surprises, aren't I? There yeah. You know, look at, look at you, um, oh, I didn't mention our sponsors. Oh, that's very true. Yeah, well, of course we have Jeps- Jepson's Malort is our in no way actually affiliated sponsor uh, for the Classic Lenses podcast. And and I, you know what? I think I mentioned them in the shout as a shout out uh, the other day. But I think we should just add these guys as a a sponsor to the podcast just because I want to say that say their name every week now. Uh, that of course would be Fuck Yo Swag. <laughs> uh, so Fuck Yo Swag and Jepson's Malort, thank you very much for sponsoring in no way the classic lenses podcast i i think i think we need a, a little bit of an explanation as to what fuck you shag <laughs> fuck, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> shag. no that's the uk version yeah, no, that's this, the UK, yeah. And, and none of that is going to get bleeped either so because it's no. because it's a trade name it's a proper it's a proper what title it? what is it exactly well they are they are uh they 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 are producers of content so they do video production generally of, uh, you know, <laughs> stuff going on here in Chicago and elsewhere. Um, and I, I think they are um, an unofficial uh, dispensary, marijuana dispensary, which make of that what you will. It's exactly what it sounds like. Um, and they're just all around interesting guys. So I think, you know, check, check out fuckyoswag.com. That's what film canisters are for, people. That's correct. Mm-hmm. That's correct. If you want to join Simon, you can uh, join him for an L in the back of a Benzie. <laughs> oh, come do you on! Mean, it's do a you Nelly mean reference. Ben- I thought you meant benzodiazepine. No! Oh, you mean a Nelly a, a, a ride a with me. Benz. Yeah, if you want to go and take Sorry, a ride with me, three women and a four with the Goldies. Oh my god! <laughs> wow. So, so I when, feel so I, old right yeah. now. So, 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 Anna, when you mentioned about us rambling, and we think that we are rambling and going on for too much, it's really interesting. Are you are you entirely sure about that? Yeah, I am. <laughs> uh, no, no, guys, conversation. It's just nice. It's com- the, the point is, it, it's like being in the room with you guys, and it's lovely. Is <laughs> the only Nelly song you've ever heard hot in here? Yeah, that's yeah. the only one I ever wanted. Oh, yeah. come on. <laughs> Country Grammar is his best one because now I'm just imagining Simon walking down the road with his camera 
singing like Street Sweeper Baby Cock Ready to Let It Go because it's like <laughs> such an OG. Know, that, that could refer <laughs> just as much to his horizon as to a gun. Oh my God. There's an image I won't be able to wipe from my eyes for a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's 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 end the show as quickly as we no, can. let's keep going it's this is getting better getting and better in here simon yes but yeah. you better take off all your clothes yes right um so <laughs> that's this has been the classic lenses podcast um, um and um you're gonna hear our outro music it might even be playing right now uh, and it's uh, called octo blues by kevin mcleod in Competech. oh that's johnny making rumbling noises there uh in Competech.com. Um, so that's it I hope you've enjoyed this week's show uh, well done if you have and, and, and if you're still here and um, so uh, if you can be like Carl oh there you go chaos All at the right. end right. yeah. awesome yeah. hey right. <laughs> oh my god oh. That's your new anthem for when That's you go. That's exactly in. how I picture a life with Simon if we were to hang out. Carl's not Carl's ice uh, sonar two point eight one three five. Yeah, it's a good lens for my uh, contacts. Yeah. That's a- yeah, it's nice really line. heavy, uh, but I took that out on a photo walk, and that was lovely. Really, is it really is, it, yeah. is it MM or AE? Uh, let's see, T style cars. I it's no, no, neither. It won't it's neither. You won't yeah. say it. Green aperture f twenty two. Is it green or white? Uh, f twenty two is white. Uh, uh, you got ninja stars. I've got ninja stars. Yeah. Yeah, when you stop it down a little, the aperture will be ninja star shaped. Ooh. Exciting. Well, let's have a good play with that. <laughs> Made in Germany or Japan? Uh, let's have a look. Um, how can I tell? It'll say on the base. Oh, yeah. Well. <laughs> Made, in, Made in Japan. Okay, AEJ. Cool. Nice. My God, you're geeky. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're like me and my... I thought I was... You're as geeky about cameras and lenses as I am about soul and funk on vinyl. Hey, you you, you go on Sunny 16 and get yelled at for buying cameras. That will not happen here. I, I know. Those guys are like, they'll happily use a box brownie all day. Oh, I'm so glad that they didn't give, like, do what, do what, do to me what they did to you when you were talking about point and shoots. Because I was like, uh, I think I'm a lot worse than that guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's not a good sound. What was that? All that. Was that you, Anil? What? What happened? It was like... <sighs> yes. Yeah. No, that was me. Yeah, I just took my headphones off and took my sweater off. It's getting a okay. bit warm in here. Yeah. <laughs> it's getting hot in here. <laughs> that's exactly what came into my head as well. Jesus Christ. <laughs> and I took I off think, all my clothes. <laughs> Simon would be the one to start singing Nelly. Oh, man. <laughs> Who'd have thought it, eh? Oh, dear.